JH Diesel, what is going on, man? Um, dude, I wanted to say, first off, I am pumped to see how far YouTube has kind of come for you, I feel like. In the last, what is it, probably three months, it has really became like a full thing. We have finally been able to go full time. Uh, took a while, but it was just me and my buddy, Justin. Uh, you met Justin, right? Um, I think I do. No, I maybe. He's definitely been with me at the track and stuff, but he's filming or doing whatever. And so, um, but yeah, so we were like, obviously, I had a YouTube channel since like 2010. Yeah. I had no clue what you could do with YouTube. I posted dumb videos on it. I was posting some videos with music on it. It was getting music videos, just all kinds <laughs> of stuff. I didn't know. I was like, whatever, you know, nobody yeah. really knew back then. So, um, and then whenever I flipped my truck in the pond... Ah, literally, my, that was it. it had been inactive, basically flipped my truck in the pond. We gained 10,000 followers overnight. And I was like, I have to, like, it's just stupid yeah. not to use this as my platform. So yeah, and then we kind of worked it up for a couple years, me and him were working like after hours. And uh, finally, we got to the point where he was full, I was good enough. And he was good enough. He quit his job. He started working for me full time about three to six months. I don't know the exact time, but probably about close to six months ago. And uh, since then, we've really been able to like push the videos and the content yeah. out. That's super hard, as you know. Yeah, so. of course. I mean, that's like 90% of it. But I think you have that ability where you have a shop. So you kind of get like, I, I think that's kind of the, uh, the better YouTube channels often are like play off of like a shop. And because there's like real content going on, possibly like real I keep, things. I do keep my shop out of it. So like I don't do any customer work yeah. on the channel, but having the shop there is the name and stuff already. It's kind of, you know, it the does name make it. and people know like your day to day working on vehicles. You know what you're talking about. You're not just like some dude in his backyard with a bunch of chickens telling you about cars <laughs> like he thinks that he knows what he's talking about. Like you have like a, a real resume and reputation. So I think that that like immediately gives some. I hope legitimacy. It gives me, I hope it gives me legitimacy. Yeah, I do. I hope it does. Yeah. I mean, that's you know, it like wasn't, people take your word it, for it. Yeah, on things. like you know, I have done a lot. I mean, I have had my own shop for 14 years, and you know, I've learned a lot in that 14 years. I went to college before that for diesel mechanics yeah. and all that stuff. So, so I'm not just like you know, try. I mean, there's I don't know everything. There's stuff I learn every day, mm -hmm. but I I still to every day, you know, for the most part we're we know what we're doing you know as far as that goes yeah so and then having like a shop that is running is obviously a huge well, what's part nice of it. Is, is when i started the channel i already had all the equipment yeah that's a huge thing you start your own little shop you have to buy this build that build that well we mm -hmm. built it all for the shop so i've just used that and now we've put our own area in the back and now we literally are just about self-sufficient on the like youtube content side. creation side yeah yep. that's kind of part of it too is they have to be both kind of the same wing of like both a wing of the same bird to yep. keep themselves going. And then it's cool because now if you can subsidize yourself off of YouTube, then the shop can have more money exactly. to grow YouTube, on its own side. YouTube, but the YouTube is helps. the marketing of it. Exactly. YouTube definitely helps. The shop is almost, you know, self-sufficient right now. I still have to be there, you know. Um, I'm there almost basically every day uh, unless we go on like a trip or like we're doing an event or something. But for the most part, I'm there every day. You have to be. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a business, so you can't just let it go and – just hope for the best. Especially so. like a customer service business where it's your name on the building. Yep. But it seems like you've kind of switched what you do a little bit. Like you, like you're now more like kind of trying to do fleet stuff or more trying to do like. We have to. Yeah. I mean, they kind of, as you know, like the EPA yeah. crushed me. And like, so when that happened and we got our fine and we weren't allowed to do deletes or anything or perf we, it's not that you can't do deletes. The That is a huge part of it. But the problem is the diesel industry, you get a new truck out and the fur everybody, who's the first to tune it? Who's the first to build an exhaust? Who's the first to do this? We can't do that anymore. Yeah. You know, like that's gone now. Now it's how much power can we make with emissions on, which isn't a bad thing. They've come up. I will say emissions have come a long way since they basically got introduced back in like 2000. I'm going to say 2008 EGRs came out or before that, but EGRs didn't affect the engine as much like a DPF. Yeah. So, I mean, once the DPFs came out, I mean, perform or the DPF has come a long way since, but it kind of killed our performance market. So now I'd rather do repair rather than performance because trying to do performance 
can't get this, you can't get that anymore, you can't do this. Now we got to worry about a DPF plugging up if we are making it faster, stuff like that. It just kind of creates more problems. Well, the EGR stuff is even on like gas vehicles, but absolutely, it's really easy to take that stuff off a gas vehicle, but it's really bad on some early gas vehicles because it's from the exhaust. So the exhaust is this rust covered thing. Now you have an yeah. exhaust leak under your hood. Well, it's, it's <laughs> worse on the, I think it's almost worse on the diesels because diesels make soot. Yeah. So, you know, we'll pull trucks apart with 150, 200,000 miles on it. And you know, the hole is that big, but it's now that big because there's that much mm -hmm. carbon and soot that have built up on it. It's insane the amount of restrictions it gives your engine. Especially on a truck that's probably not used that hard. Like yeah. a lot of people like maybe just drive their diesel around. If you're not like really getting it hot, really putting it to work, it's probably even worse. I tell people all the time, I'm like, run the truck. Like I, we get people all the time. I got a truck in there right now. It's a 6'4 power stroke. And um, it is like every sensor, the EBP sensor, the map sensor, everything was plugged. There were, the, the turbos were stuck. I mean, it's been, the whole thing has just been, you know, um, just everything is plugged because the guy, I think, just drove it very easy. Yeah. Never really opened it up. So I tell people all the time, you know, don't be afraid to open the truck up and let it clean itself out. So he's sitting there thinking, oh, I, I babied this <laughs> thing. And that's actually <laughs> what made it worse. In reality, it made it worse. She didn't tell anything. Sad. Yeah, it, in reality, it made it worse. Oh, that's a that's a bummer because you think like, oh, I'm about to sell this great vehicle. Yep. And even the used diesel market is sky high price right now. Insane. But bottom of the barrel reliability because once you have a diesel that's a hundred thousand miles, that's a 2017. Yep. Mine is a great example. <laughs> Things are gonna start to happen. It's a guarantee. Yep. It's not an if. Like it's you gonna, were, it's gonna, it's gonna happen. Definitely, eventually, you're gonna have a DEF pump go bad, a heater go bad. You're gonna, and the problem is, and I actually just did a video on this, kind of explain to people how to help keep your trucks living. Um, one of the problems is, is like when a check engine light comes on for like an, a knock sensor, something simple. Well, now your DPF does not regen or work. So now it's just plugging up. So when people let it ride and they're like, ah, we'll fix it whenever, you know, got to check engine light mm -hmm. on, fix it whenever, when they're just doing so much more damage because it's plugging everything up, nothing's yeah. working. So EGR is not working, the DPF's not working. How long That's, has your check engine light been on? It come, it goes on and off. Oh. <laughs> like it'll, it'll randomly come on and then like- I see your I'll, face, you're like, yeah. hmm, thinking like, hmm, dang. I know. I, <laughs> I've, like it's a love hate with that truck because I know it's a great truck, but I know it's gonna try to hit me for everything I got when it needs money. Absolutely. Like it's yeah. not like, oh, like you know, I feel like there's a thing like if a if you got a gas vehicle and somebody with moderate level of automotive knowledge can fix a gas vehicle, the diesel stuff is so next level complex and it at least like the L5P. Like when you open that hood, there's a lot going on there. It can be intimidating. They can be, but it's, it's, you know, I tell people this all the time. They're like, oh, it's, you know, this isn't going from like back in the day when you were manually time, you know, mechanically timing injection pumps and stuff. It's, it is a lot different. And a lot of the stuff now is very similar. You open a table to a diesel, open it up for a gas, you'd probably be surprised at how similar stuff is yeah. tuning or anything like that. You're going to look at it and be like, it's pretty. I was just more thinking like mechanically wise, yeah. like you got to know what you're doing. There's a lot of stuff in there. Yeah. You like, open the hood and they're full. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at open the hood of a Tahoe and it's like, where's it? Oh, it's way down there. And then you look at a Duramax and it's like, there's no room to put anything around mm -hmm. this thing. That's it. You can visually diagnose a Tahoe <laughs> yeah. basically yeah. with any issue that it has. <laughs> like everything is right there. No matter if it's like a 2001 Tahoe to like a 2020, they're yeah. like the they're, same under the hood. Pretty much. Yeah. But then the diesels, like I own an L5P and I cannot tell you LMM, l M L L whatever yeah. L L Y like yep. the generations for like the Duramax stuff get it's, hyper confusing. It's funny how it's it's L B seven L O I L B Z L M M L M L then L five P and they also threw in some smaller stuff there L L G H which is like the other style of L M L and and it's just they threw a couple of other things in there that, that like doesn't inspire really confidence. Mess you up. <laughs> yeah. Knowing that yeah. they had to change it that many times <laughs> doesn't make me feel confident well, as a consumer. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yes <laughs> and no, yes and no, because it really you look at like the earlier model. The only difference between them, which they change pistons, they, but it's still a six point six liter yeah. Duramax diesel. The blocks, the pistons, they're they're different and upgraded. But I mean, everything you could take something out of a 2016 and put it in a 2001. Okay. So you can interchange if there's no reason to. It'd be stupid to do that. But, but um, uh, there are some stuff we used to do back in the day, like 
take an LOI and we would use LB7 pistons with LBZ rods because the rods are stronger, but their pistons are weaker. So we used to kind of mix and match cheap cheap builds back in the day and yeah. stuff. So they, they actually are pretty much similar. Th that makes sense. Yeah. I, I just imagine when a company changes something almost every year, I worry, no, why are they yeah. doing it? Yeah. Because if you look at like the LS, they used it for 30 years until they physically couldn't anymore. Yeah. And then like a Cummins, they're so similar across the board. Yeah, they are, but they are. I mean, it's it's kind of the sim. What what the reason? Biggest reason where everybody's changing everything is emissions. Yeah, that's why everything is constantly changing because you know. And when they change the emissions, not only every time they change an engine, the horsepower gets upped. So anytime they change that engine code, and that's the same with all of them. They pretty much all. I mean, an 01 Duramax was 305 horsepower. Uh, 2024 Duramax is now um, 475 horse now. So you're talking almost 200 horsepower over the span of yeah. 20, a little over 20 years. Which doesn't sound so. crazy, but also the torque and torque, yeah. the, like, what's under the graph, I guess, like, where they make it is so much more usable. Exactly. And then the transmissions, you went from a 5-speed yeah. to a 6-speed, now a 10-speed. So just they're just trying to keep up with the times and make everything better. You've been always kind of keeping up with your trucks, too. Is that just because you like to know what your customers are getting? Like, <laughs> um, like because I feel like every every time a new generation comes out, you switch to the new one. Yeah. And is that just to, like, show, like, I, I'm figuring this out along with us? Not necessarily. It's honestly a reliability thing. So, like, when we go to the events uh, and we're towing, and I'm not saying an older truck can't be reliable, it can be, but like what happened was what really made me like, I can finally afford to buy a new truck. I should buy a new truck. I should have a truck payment. Um, after college, I was in debt from, you know, student loans. I had, you know, credit cards, all this kind of yeah. stuff. So it took me a few years to pay all that stuff off. Then the business was on its way. And so in 2016, I was hauling my mud truck somewhere and uh, I had a 700 horse tire, rear, rear tire, 700 horse. 700 horsepower at the tire dually at the time. Yeah. Very practical to be towing trailers and great. stuff with. Yeah. It, ran, it ran your, uh... literally low 12s. And like, so I'm like, yeah, you know, this is going to be great. And it did work good. But then when I'm towing a 40 foot trailer, two side by sides, a mud truck, you know, we're towing all combined weight of probably 32 to 34,000 pounds. Um, I blew the motor. Uh, we were four hours from home, four and a half hours from home. Blew the engine. So the problem is it had a gooseneck. Not everybody has a gooseneck. So right. I had to find a buddy that would come four hours, four and a half hours with another truck on another trailer that had a gooseneck ball. So we could take that truck, hook my trailer up to that truck, and then took my blown up truck on the trailer. And so it was literally a 12, 14 hour ride home. Yep. It was a nightmare. And after that, I said, you know what? It's time for me to just have something that's reliable. I don't touch it. And then I bought a 16 brand new and tuned it, deleted it, did everything, blew it up in 30,000 miles. So I was like, well, learned my lesson there. So now I just keep them stock. So after that, that's that's we just keep them stock. Now. That's what I kind of always tell people. I'm like, just leave it as stock as you can. If it blows up and you're 16 hours from home, you can bring it to the dealership, swap it yep. out for something like. Yep. For the most part, you can, you know, and and it's that's the thing. I just I just didn't want to be stranded. It was such a nightmare. And we were going out of state at the time, going to Georgia, North Carolina, South yeah. Carolina, Alabama with the mud trucks. And I was like, I do not want to have to deal with the this cost again. to get stranded. Once you once you get stranded, real you realize how expensive it's going to be. It sucks. Yeah. And it's things bad. get stolen. Things disappear when that happens. Uh, yeah, that's a yeah. that's a nightmare. And then. Yeah, the the DEF stuff is a tough one. I, I was I had Doug Cook on here. And the second I mentioned DEF. His whole attitude changed. <laughs> that guy he, loves EVs and DEFs, oh, yeah. and yeah, he loves them. He loves all that. The second he heard that, he just like completely just <laughs> frustration. I could feel it. And I always say, I'm like, man, whoever, whoever pushed to lobby that to get it in there, they are crushing it. I I <laughs> I literally like at first I was like, you know, screw this. This is horrible. And and I still like I think every truck should be no emissions. I, after I got my EPA fine, like I did a lot of research mm -hmm. and figured out like how much are diesel trucks actually polluting. And it's like 0.0001% of all pollution in the world comes from automobiles. Like it's crazy the minimal number compared to a lot of other stuff. So like when that happened, obviously I was just obviously mad. I mean, I have a paper telling me I got to pay 100 and 
eighty thousand dollars, or you know, you're gonna go to prison. Yeah, so it, it's weird that you basically got that without a trial. Yeah, without anything. It's very odd that you can do that to somebody with no fair trial. There's nothing. It's just you know the the we got you, you're done. And so like dealing with all that now the DPF stuff and DEF stuff, it's just like it is what it is. It sucks, but I don't believe in it. I do think it's a joke, but at the same time, I know there's nothing you can do. And I know other guys that have tried fighting it and spent millions of dollars trying to fight it. And they are, they're getting places, but not really like it's only getting, the emissions are only getting worse. Do you kind of hope for a DEF shortage so that this has to like, in, in my opinion, if, if something like that, like there was a mass shortage, nobody could get it, then that would have to force the regular regulatory agencies to do something. I just don't think it would. You just I think, think it would they be, would be like, well, mm. it is what it is. I mean, that's what happened. It out. That's what happened when, you know, we had the uh, um, COVID and stuff. Like, I've still, I got, like, if you own a 6.7 Power Stroke right now, 6.7s, which are very current engines and stuff, is 17 and up. If you try to buy an engine for one from Ford, I just talked to my dealership two days ago. They said, well, we've had two engines on, on order since November of last year. And they still haven't got them. It takes now anywhere from three to six months, sometimes over almost a year, just to get a stock engine for a truck. Oh wow! So they don't care. It's it is what it is. I mean, yeah. they don't care. It's not their truck. They sold you the truck. You can lemon law it, but unless the lemon law, the way that works is you have to have a certain amount of times of the same issue. So if you blow mm -hmm. a motor, you can't just lemon law the truck. Yeah, you're not you gonna know? have that issue multiple times. Nope. Unless so, you put another one in there and blow it up again. Yeah. So it, it's so having a DEF shortage, I think, would be bad because I I don't think the government's gonna go well because you still have to have it. They're not gonna be like, well, deletes for everybody. You can just delete all your missions now. You're good. Yeah. They they there's no way. I don't know if they would just like legalize it. Like, you can now delete your truck legally, but the shipping industry would be crippled. Oh, the shit. I mean, the, the the bad part is, what I don't understand is the amount of money that they were making on it. I mean, you're taking a, you know, automotive industry that's multi-billion dollar industry. I don't know how much mm -hmm. it is, but I would say billions of dollars, if not more. And you're, you're, why are you going after these guys that are, you're paying shipping taxes? I mean, you guys are making a killing on us. Mm -hmm. You know, I know whenever I sell a part, you know, like, that we're all having to pay taxes. They get the sales tax in the end and everything. And it's like, I, I don't understand why they would not want it. It's almost like smoking weed or something like took them long enough to make most of that legal where they were like, okay, you know, we can make money on it. And I think they're just nickel and diamond shops is worse and trying to cripple big companies that, that, um, you know, manufacture the parts. I think it's just, it's, it's bad for everybody. There's no good to yeah. it. So even but like even 18 wheelers that have to put DEF oh, in, yeah. that is where like if if there was even a spike of 20 percent cost in DEF. Yeah. Everything is affected by that. Not everything. just like me and you sitting here and oh, we're going to Gleadis and cars, you know, cost us a little bit more. That is a massive, yep. massive hit to the shipping industry in a whole, which is already in a massive struggle. They can't find anybody to ship anything. Yep. Shipping, I've noticed, noticed uh, shipping prices have skyrocketed. Yeah, because you ship large items, so we you do. would know. It costs, to ship an engine, on average, it's like $800 to freight an engine now. Like, it's it's insane. Yeah. Like, it's like, I'll call, and they'll be like, yeah, it's 800 bucks. I'm like, $800 to do what? <laughs> to ship this crate? I'm like, what do you mean? Like, that's the engine's five grand and i gotta you know pay a fifth of that is shipping you know it's 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 crazy it's they're only gonna up it everybody's they're gonna continue to up the prices of everything so. you would think that there would be a bigger boom in like small shippers though but i feel like i haven't seen that either but then you go back to our workforce yeah you know how's our workforce been the past couple of years people are getting lazier people and don't want to work brand new trucks are becoming more expensive you can't just like oh i'm gonna get into shipping hundred thousand dollar truck sixty thousand dollar trailer <laughs> the problem is is nothing is cheap anymore and we're not making enough money to cover that like we can up our you know everybody let's do you know a lot of people were for up in minimum wage and that kind of stuff and it's like i was like that's a horrible idea we're all going to see it in the end and look what happened everything has gone up around yeah. us you know real estate it's gone up as far as food you know i used to pay I think uh, to go to McDonald's now, it's like $10, $12 for a meal at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. It used to be 5 bucks, 6 Half bucks. of that is just shipping costs, though, too. <laughs> yeah. And 
um, trucking and getting it there and you know like electricity cost has yep. gone up like crazy a lot of people are saying electricity is going up we're we actually aren't doing too bad we're on like a we're part of a co-op electricity my mine's peace river mm -hmm. what are you guys you guys fpl yeah I've heard FPL's gone up like crazy. Uh, no, we're Peace River here, too. You're Peace yeah. River? Peace River here. So I don't think ours has gone up that much, but FPL people said it's, like, going crazy. I've seen it a little bit, but it's also been, like, I don't think my AC has stopped this time of year. Yeah. Even yeah. though I'm keeping it warmer than I kept it last year. It's just, yeah. it's, we've had this record heat wave, it feels like. that. Yeah. It's been hot. It's been a hot year this year. Dry and hot. It came hot early, and you say it's been dry. We've had the driest year I've had in a long time. Yeah, it's pretty crazy, because, like, I... Normally, I'm like, oh, cool, like grass growing time of year. And I'm like, no, eh, my grass isn't growing. It's all right. Yeah, I can let it go another month. It's good. Yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> I I mean, I I don't mind because sometimes when it rains and then it just bakes like a clam. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it feels like yeah. you're just like in a sauna yeah. after the rain. And I'm sure you guys feel it pretty bad in your shop because. Definitely. It happens. We're not insulated or nothing, but I've been in a shop like that all my life. So it's not a big deal. Yeah, so. there's not much you can do about it a shop like that when you have no. to have vehicles coming in and out and not in Florida. How how is it with text though too? Is it almost impossible to get good text? Super tough. Uh I that's a battle that I'm constantly fighting. Um it seems like anytime we get a solid crew and I don't want to jinx myself, but right now I have a solid crew. My guys are awesome. I've got a good diag guy. I've got um three good technicians and I've got a office manager and everybody pulls their own weight. Everybody's doing really good, but I just had to find a tech because I had a guy that was with me for eight years, go do his own thing and uh, more power, you know, left on good terms. Hey, he's going to do his own shop. Yeah. I'll never fault someone for doing better for themselves. Eight years. I and mean, he, he did his time, you he know, he definitely did. He's awesome. So, and we still talk, we're good. And so I had to find another tech to replace him. And I mean, I had job ads out there. I had all this stuff and it's so hard to find someone that's reliable, can do what they say they're going to do, shows up every day. I mean, I don't know where the workforce went. It's just it's just gone, and I don't understand it. Or a lot of people I see are starting their own place, which is good, but the problem is you start your own place, and you don't really know what you're doing or how to run the business. You're going to yeah. basically not – it's going to go bad. It's so. a tough time to start now, too, because four years ago, money was cheap. You yeah. could take out an easy loan and go get yourself a nice shop, spend all the money, get yourself a big snap on toolbox. Yep. But now if you're going to start something and you're going to pay 10, 12 percent interest rate on like tools and a, interest rates a are crazy roof right over now. your head yep. and rent in this area, you're I just can't see it as being viable to yeah. start now. Yeah, it's it, it's just such a tough time to start unless you can like get a bay at somebody else's deal. A lot of guys, like, like the guy that used to work for me, he's trying to rent a bay from someone right now. So he's going to go rent a bay out, yeah. of, you know, and, it, and it's reasonable, you know, and and uh, so that's what he's trying to do. But trying to start up, man, like, you know, I just, you know, it's it's definitely a lot of work, all the equipment, all the stuff you need. And um, but finding techs is very difficult. And anybody with a shop, I think, will tell you finding techs is just a very especially diesel techs because they're specialized yeah so i've even told people i don't care if you're an auto tech or a diesel tech we'll train you to work on diesels they're not much different once you get into them it's not much different than mm -hmm. gas stuff it's just diagnostic and repair you know so there's little things you'll learn but for the most part you know it's not that bad and then in our area as well you're we're kind of unfortunately the area is kind of pushing out people that maybe pushing people work out. on vehicles absolutely it's pushing out the your blue collar guys for yeah. sure i mean i grew up here and i watch what's going on and it's like they don't want people i hate to say it, but like mancy county they don't want people like us blue collar guys doing it they say they do they can do all they want but they want the retired people or the people that want to come down from up north or they want people that can buy a house cash and they're here and that's what it's turning into, unfortunately. Well, you can tell because all the new houses are like, you can't put two vehicles parked in the yeah. yard, yeah. Based, and, like in the driveway. Like yeah. it's so small, you can't even like, And you then know, a car like, guy needs room for a car to or something. And then if you let a car sit in the street overnight, you get a fine. So. Yeah, you move into a you know, place like Parker's and you can't even have <laughs> your truck. 
yeah. your $150,000 yeah. dentist guy truck. You know what I mean? It's like, this We're, is a normal vehicle. <laughs> yep. This is a normal, nice, like more expensive than your cars that you have. And it's like, like, you know, whoever's living there and it's like, you're not allowed to have that. Like it doesn't make a lot the of sense. The two best selling vehicles of all time in the U.S. are like F-150 and then 1500 Silverado. Yeah. And then like the Dodge is like number three or four. Yeah. Like Yeah. And now they want them out. Like, no, nah, we don't want those things in our neighborhood. Like, yeah. I get not wanting a work van or something in your neighborhood. I don't get it, but I get it. Like, I get it. I'd never want to live in a place like that. But, you know, somebody that's got a really nice King Ranch truck, leave them alone. Like, it's a nice truck. Leave it alone. You know, don't don't mess with them. You would think that would be fine. It's such a crazy thing that that's, like, that's a problem. Yeah. So weird. Well, the EPA stuff, um, where do we where do we even go from here with this? Like, I talked to Jay from Ignite. I had him on. He's very, very smart on this stuff, super opinionated on it. Jay is in it a lot more than me, which he obviously has a lot more invested than me to a point money-wise, you know? He's got a farm. And he yeah, has diesel I mean, vehicles he is, as far as you can see. He is definitely... So whenever I got my fine, um, uh, I don't know if you want to go over that now or later, whatever. Yeah, or, we can yeah, talk about that. Like, you know, they basically, from here on out, where that's going to go, I mean, when I got my fine... Jay was one of the people that actually reached out to me whenever I announced it. I was super scared to put it out there that I got my fine because I'm like, man, like, how does that look on me? You know, like, I really didn't do anything, but here I am literally looking at possibly prison time. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's not like go to county jail. It's federal prison, like, yeah. for putting exhausts and tuners on trucks. And like, it's not a threat. There's somebody no, sitting in jail right now from it. Absolutely, there is. And um, I don't know if it's more than one person. I know of a person. Yeah, and and Jay reached out to me, put me in touch with a lot of people. But even those people, you know, like as I knew um, another gentleman, which I can't remember his name right now. He owned a Mustang shop that got hit pretty hard. And he's super nice guy. We've been friends on Facebook now. I just It's John something. Lund, yeah. John Lund. Lund. Yeah, John, yeah, John Lund. I'm sorry. Yeah. So he put me in John Lund, him. There was a congressman from his state. Uh, they raided his... They raided too. his. Yeah, they did. They like, didn't raid me. They sent me a letter, and I, I was told that the reason I got the letter was because it was during COVID. So I hit. I got mine in 2020. They do a Zoom call raid. They did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My computer just pops up. Yeah. Like, what the heck? Walk us around the shop. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, uh, they actually sent me an RFI, which is called a request for information. And what RFI is, is they want, they said, we need all of your invoices from this date to this date. And it was three months. And it's like the letter that you get from what I've heard is like, they know when you got it. Like it's like, do. it's like stamped type of thing where like, they know that you, you can't just be like, I never saw it. Yeah. Because they, know you got they it. will con, they will get it. You know, I think it actually was, um, uh, certified or something. Somebody That's had what it signed is, yeah. for. And I mean, it was not just a little letter. I mean, it was a book. They sent me a mini book, you know, and. Ooh. So I'm like, man, like, what is going And you'd heard horror stories about people getting caught and people, but it's like, man, like, and I'll be honest, we made a lot of money on doing deletes. So in the As end, you had the right to do. Yeah, I mean, in we, my opinion. It, was, it was good money because it did take us where now you get a truck in with an EGR problem. Back then it was like, ah, oh, your EGR is bad. Put a tuner on it, get rid of the EGR, get rid of the DPF. You'll love it. And and that was honestly... Better truck at the end of the day. It, it is. The truck's more reliable. And I got so much more praise from the customers for that. We had so many happy customers. They'd come in and they would leave. i get a call down the road. I'm getting five more miles to the gallon. I love this thing. It, it, I didn't realize what I was missing. I should have done it right when I bought the truck. You yeah. know, that was our common call to get back on that. And they took that away from us. Like, it sucks because now we put an engine in somebody's truck, they get it back and they're like, thanks. I just spent a lot of money to put an engine in here that, yeah. you know, and it's like, you know, just, I don't know, just a little bit was just, it was really nice to be able to do that for people. And you got the, the, their feedback where they were super happy, but they sent me an RFI. Um, I, I was like kind of freaked out and I got a lawyer, an attorney. I called around, talked to some people, a lot of attorneys too. This is something you call like an environmental attorney. He has no idea about this yeah. stuff. You'd be surprised at how minimal attorneys are that know what is going on and know how to fix this stuff. Unfortunately, no one does. No. I sat down with the local congressman, their their main assistant, mm -hmm. and told her all about this. And she was like, we had no idea. And I was like, well, what do you guys think? And she's like, well, we have a lot of other problems going on. I'm like, that's not the answer no. that the it's person not. wants to hear that's dealing with this stuff the problem is it's not a big enough issue and i like literally like was ready to 
make a thing and go to like Capitol Hill and have everybody park their cars in front of Capitol Hill. And if I get arrested, I get arrested it is what yeah. it is. Like I was ready to do it and I never did it. I was wanting to do it. I was like, man, we should do it. And I, th I don't know, I asked a few people and everybody was like, I would go, I would go. And it's like one of those things where I don't think it's known enough. And that's why it's not known enough. And they hide stuff in bills and you don't, you, they don't even know what they're signing half the time. They're like, oh, I know this is good, but you know, and, and I don't know, we could be talking about politics all day because of course there's so many just negative things that happen and go on. And it's like, they're, they're, they don't realize what they're doing. They're killing an industry. You're killing someone's passion. I mean, this is not, they can say what they want. It's not hurting people. It's not hurting the earth. Uh, it, it, it's not our, our earth can sustain this. No problem. There's far bigger fish to fry. But as my attorney told me, um, it's, we don't have enough money. He said, we, your industry, the automotive industry, and he's taking care of a lot of the guys in the automotive industry. He said, you don't have enough money to fight it. Your industry doesn't make enough money to fight it because the people that are going to fight against you are oil industries, gas industries. They have them in their pockets. Yeah. So he said, he says, that's the industries you're going to be fighting against. Even though like, yes, we're the automotive industry, but this problem affects the farming industry it affects the RV industry, which is tiny. It affects the trucking industry, which is massive. It affects massive amounts. It does, but they don't see it. And that the boating way. industry too. The boat. Well, yeah, the boating I heard is getting really bad too. Yeah, so, like people with, and those people do have money. Yeah, <laughs> the people with the like the big seventy boats. foot I, yacht does I think have it's money. Viking, I read where they like were like, we cannot meet your requirements. Yeah. Like we can't make this boat perform or this engine with this boat cannot perform and they like we're like we can't make another boat right now they don't care they're yeah. like oh okay oh well yeah they i don't guess care. you go out of business yeah pretty much that's what they that's how it is it's terrible how that is i like, mean this is how we feed 50 families by making these boats easily. and you're gonna put us out of business yeah that's what we're doing yep oh no remorse no care it is okay. what it is yep but because but we're going to tax you if you try to make them out of the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, now you're going to be taxed more if you make them out of the country. Yeah. So, so then make your choice. Either just fold or, you know, figure it out. Yep. Get some better engineers. Yep, and that's what they're saying. They're like, we can't even, end. like, we haven't found a way to engineer it how they want us to. So, I mean, it's, you know, I don't know. It's, it's a bad deal. It's just bad. And the whole situation, it was very nerve-wracking. I dealt with it for, I think, over a year. It took them a year to finally get back with me and give me my fine. Once I gave them the information, um, and they took my customers' information, like their addresses, their yeah. they have all that. I can't How do, do you think they it. found out about you? So from what I'm told is is it's all comes down from the top. Do they give you like discovery, like you know when you like? No, they don't give you. When anything. you go to court, you have to get their well, discovery information. I never did go to court. If it's so. a real, like if it was actually the judicial process yep. that is laid out, you in the get a discovery file from how they got yeah. their information. So. Basically, they either were fishing and they just got get lucky, which I don't think is the case. From what I'm told is we were dealers for like SCT. SCT got hit. We were dealers for massive wholesalers that all got hit. So we were buying all these products from these people. And so the manufacturers got hit. They got their RFIs, got their dealer lists. Then their wholesalers got hit, got their RFIs, got their dealers, dealer list. Then I got hit. So it's that's weird how they went for... Like people like you and Brett, Brent and like John Lund, like they went for like the people that are on the ground floor. Yep. It was, it, that was always weird to me. I was like, it's really obvious who makes it possible to do this. Exactly. It's, you can go online and still find it and do everything. Like they had to step over them. Yeah. But they did, but you. they didn't. I think they used them because they had already been hit already for the most part. All those guys were already getting RFIs and stuff. Yeah. But they're not going to tell their customers that. You're not going to tell your customers, hey, I got an RFI just so you know from the EPA. Yeah. So you're still buying the stuff because once they give you the RFI, that doesn't mean you can stop selling it. You can still do it. You can continue to do it until your case is done. And they don't go back and they don't go back and go, well, as far as I know, they don't go back and go, well, you did it up until this date. It didn't matter. It was just until they give you your fine and then you sign that piece of paper saying, I refuse to do it again, then then you don't, 
you can still do it from you can't do it but you can get away yeah. with it for the most part and so. then their goal is to find you so much that it's basically not profitable to do it because like exactly it, there could be a situation where it's like oh we can do this for you but we do pay a 200 dollars fine when we do it well they, they it was funny they said well here's your fine it's one hundred and eighty seven thousand dollars, whatever my fine was just a and small like, house payment small, yeah, and they said house. but but if you can pay in 30 days it's 22 grand I'm like, where do you come up with this number? And then they said, but if you can't pay in thir- in in 30 days, they will give you a I think a 15 or 30 day extension, but that's it. You get like one extension, but they want it in a lump sum. Because I said, what about a payment plan? Can I do the 22,000 a payment plan? If you go on a payment plan, then you have to uh, pay it through a payment plan. But I don't know what the amount is. I said, well, what's the amount? We don't know until you decline the pay until you decline the. So they won't tell you that amount. So mm-hmm. your payment plan could be the 182 that 180 whatever thousand dollars. Yeah. And you don't know that. They don't tell you. It's like a game. They're like, well, if you decline that spin the wheel. Yeah. It's like <laughs> if you told me like it was I go on a payment plan for five years and it was twenty five grand, I'd go, okay, that might be reasonable, that might be better, rather than, you know, taking a huge chunk of your savings out or whatever, the business account out. I was like, man, like this is crazy. Well, and, you're um, lucky. I mean, how many businesses get hit with that and just bankruptcy well they immediately would, they would have to they would either bankrupt or you they won't let you bankrupt that's the thing they won't let it because they'll put you on the payment plan and it yeah. is what it is it's but how much is the payment plan i have no idea i do, i talked to my attorney i'm like what can we do like what can we do to to get me out of this what can i do to fight it and he's like there's nothing he according to him there's nothing you can do. He's you can't like, even stand trial you, for you, that. You can't. You can, but then you are looking at the full hundred eighty some thousand dollars, and if you lose, plus you have to pay all the court costs and stuff. So you go in there, and you might be, yeah. If you want to fight it, you're more than welcome to fight it. I haven't known anybody that's fought it and won though. Yeah. I mean, we did it. We deleted the trucks. Was that an illegal thing to do? In an EPA law, I guess. But I mean, really, what what am I doing? You know, like unjust I'm not, laws deserve not to be followed. I, in my yeah, opinion, absolutely unjust laws. Absolutely, it's it's nonviolent noncompliance. Yep, it exactly. Is not hurting any and, single and person. In their head, though, and a lot of the uh, you know certain people's heads that s- truly believe this is such a bad thing, their eyes they are like, no, this is killing people every year. These emissions are killing mm-hmm. people, but it's not. I mean. And they're like, oh, emissions is causing global warming. No, we have how much more asphalts on the ground now than 50 years ago? How many how much how many trees have you killed to build houses, neighborhoods, cities, taken dirt roads, made them paved roads, whatever? How much more asphalt is on? I mean, asphalt creates heat, you know, like and that's a true thing that I talked to somebody about. And they're like, it's literally going to radiate heat. It's going to cause more heat. This is terrible. Emissions are not what's doing. It's everything else. And then. Let's go EV. I mean, EV is like, I mean, that's literally like, let's go to this mine and we're going to use all these diesel equipment with no emissions to mine lithium and mine all these special materials to put in a DPF or to put in a battery. But we're going to do all this extra work, manufacture DEF. Now we have to make this toxic chemical and all this stuff. Children labor. Yeah. And it's better for us. Like it is literally like you're doing 10 times worse behind the scenes just because you can't see it right in front of you. Mm-hmm. You know, people just, if they can't see it, it's out of sight, out of mind. They don't care what's going on over there. They don't, they don't see all that. They don't even think about that. Well, it's cool because the batteries are mined in Africa, in the Congo. The battery material <laughs> is shipped to China. <laughs> then it, some of it's assembled in China. Then they ship it over to like Sweden for another assembly. Then and, they ship it, over, ship it over to the U.S. And obviously for final. to ship it, it's all done by an electric vehicle, right? Yeah. Because shipping oh, is yeah. all done by electric vehicle. They're not using trains. They're not using cruise ships or not cruise. They're not using container ships or yep. massive mega ships. And they're not doing any of that. They're, airplanes. Yeah, for they're chips. not using airplanes. Like, <laughs> come on, you know, like it's it's just. It's literally like it's amazing to me how close minded some people can I'll be. I'll throw about this it. out now too. I am talking and looking for people that are experts on climate change to Absolutely. come on to talk to me. If anybody I, I know of a few people that I've been trying to get a hold of to come on here that are like completely very knowledgeable on this. Definitely I, that would be an episode for for Doug Cook. To come join. To come join. Yeah. <laughs> but I'd love to find somebody that like is 
knowledgeable and has, I hate to say, um, fits my agenda. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the best use of... <laughs> I mean, you know, if somebody has the facts, then I'll great. Have them on I both mean, sides. I'll absolutely. Have. I mean, I want whatever's right. And the thing is, I did. I mean, I sat there for days, nights on end, where I'm just like, you know, I work during the day, and then at night, I'm like, all right, I am researching this. It's very hard to find for a regular person to go find yeah. research on this stuff. It's not as easy as you would think. But for what I did find, the numbers I found, and how much, you know, I think I think I read it was, uh, and it's been a few years since I've circled back to it, but there's like 55 million automobiles in the world, active running automobiles in the world. And they create about as the same amount of emissions as one mega ship does in like, like mm -hmm. a year. Like it's like the same. And that's 55 million compared to one out of dozens of those ships. And it's like, to know those numbers is just, its it doesn't make a lick of sense. What um, always gets me is military vehicles are non-emission compliant. The president's, they don't have the to president's Cadillac limo is tuned, the beast. is tuned by Corey Willis. Like yeah. it's deleted with a CP3 conversion. It's got a Duramax in it and it's deleted with a CP3 conversion and it's literally no emissions. Yeah. Like it's, it's uh, you know, what like excuse I think, me i think ford was sending a bunch of trucks over to europe Ukraine. i'll say europe, yeah yeah sorry <laughs> they sent them over to europe yeah. somewhere and they were all non There's some guy that compliant. posted a video on and it went viral on like uh social media it was, it was a bunch like, of like brand new white dualies yep just, yep no emissions straight exhaust with yep. uh like i don't even know if they had a cat it was just like a muffler like a tiny muffler in the back to quiet it down i was like somebody was building we get this like what is going on here they were probably like, well, we got to make it more reliable. Yeah, well, 100%. <laughs> that's part of the issue is they have to um, make them more reliable, you know. And we talk to people in, like, we do work for firefighters and uh, first responders and stuff. And a lot of their stuff will still have it, but they can bypass it from what I'm being told. Like, there's a way for them to, like, they can't bypass it, but, like, there's, like, a switch where if it goes off, they can just hit it when they're in an emergency, mm -hmm. and it's going to keep going. So huh. it won't shut them down. Don't know that as a fact. Firefighters, maybe to be, I've heard that, but that's what I've heard, where they have the ability to, like, kill it so it won't shut them down in an emergency. Some of those newer ones, I would imagine, I mean, those are, the fire trucks are badass. I've yeah. always been in awe by some of those. Absolutely. Those things. They're just, yeah. like, the coolest of the cool. Yeah. They have the, all, like, the, like, like I, I do work for one of the guys that does a lot of ordering for the fire department. He's like, we literally will order you know, like we order the best of the best we do, but you know, we need it, you know, like it's not that we just, but we want something that we don't have to worry about it breaking down. We don't have to worry about it being underpowered and killing you 55 mile an hour. Mm -hmm. And we got to do 60, 65 or whatever it is, or 70 down the interstate. I don't know how fast fire trucks go, but well, even in like California, when, you know, they start to get surrounded by forest fires and it happens in Florida too, but not really, not it's not bad. common, but like California, like they'll literally get trapped. Yeah. Like they'll like Absolutely. the fires will come around them and you think like, oh, it's a fire. You see where it's going. Like it's crazy. no, it comes over a hill and then like all of a sudden you're just surrounded. They said one of the largest wildfires out there was started by a DPF that broke. Oh, I'm not kidding. It's cause, so when DPFs would fail, like especially on the earlier stuff, they would start shooting flames out. Oh, I've seen of videos stuff. of that. And apparently, look again, this is just what I'm saying. I was told I'm telling you what I was told is they actually found where DPF like had broken, broken pieces where like a fire had started and it caused a major fire over there. Ooh, that's but they a, don't want to hear that over there. No, it's, yeah. it's a bad but, deal. Yeah. Well, forest fires are weird because like that's another one where people are like, look at what we're doing to the environment. But like forest fires happen out in Alaska where nobody's at. Absolutely. Nobody's even yeah. there and they Absolutely. still happen. And you're like, well, it's kind of a natural <laughs> thing. Like, yep. They're not always started or man-made like. Well, most of the time it started by lightning. So a storm with lightning is like, from what mm -hmm. I've always learned, is like that's normally how a forest fire yeah. started. Even last year, like some of the climate people were were like, I told you so when we got hit by the worst hurricane. <laughs> in like, they're like, you see what happens when you uh, mess with, like. What are you talking about? You're telling I told you so to a guy that just lost his house. Yeah, like what? You mean you told you? Are you a science, scientist? No, you're not. Just go back and. <laughs> Go go find a tree or something. A hurricane know. that's hit Florida forever. <laughs> yeah, like we literally have years. So you're saying Hurricane Andrew back in 1990 that was climate change? I mean, come on, it was it leveled Miami. You know, yeah. like that wasn't climate change. It's a storm. Like, We're in a weird time right now because the 
the Gulf and both the Atlantic are really warm. Extremely hot. I think it's record numbers right now. And it is. I think we did get lucky because we got some cool air coming from the north. It seems like that might help us, but I'm yeah. worried about this year's. Well, people are all like, oh, it's all this climate change. And it's like you look at the Earth's you know, past and what happened. This is not uncommon to yeah. happen. The Earth is the Earth does this. It's it's all it's constantly evolving. Yeah, it's and a dynamic climate, is what they call it, because yeah. it's changing. Exactly, it would and be weird if it wasn't. I'm not saying that certain things that we do speed it up, but it ain't the automotive industry. I mean, that's very, 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 very minimal. Like I said, on the scale mm -hmm. of what is actually causing the issues. Yeah, I would imagine, especially like hot rodders. Yeah, we use our cars less. Yeah, <laughs> like honestly. All my cars, all my trucks are broken half the time. Like, I don't ever get to drive them for yeah. performance stuff. I like, mean, if anybody thinks any of my cars that are at my house are bad <laughs> for the environment, you're crazy. Yeah, like, like you are literally, and they'll get in, like, a 1986 <laughs> Honda Civic, and it's, like, just smoking. And it's, like, I'm just trying to save the environment here. Or, yeah. or a Prius, and we all know how bad Priuses are. Terrible for the environment. Whoa, so. whoa, whoa. <laughs> Toyota? <laughs> Toyota crushed it on the Prius, and they haven't had to do really anything since. I can't kill mine. It really honestly pisses me off. They over-designed that thing, and now it's just like this it's, permanent staple. It's the stupidest car in the world. It's ugly, and I can't kill mine. <laughs> Here, let's try. put this license plate in sight. <laughs> we'll add a license plate to this, so. <laughs> we'll, we'll add it to the um, collection for now. There we go. There now go. it's visible during the podcast, at least. It'll probably yeah. fall over, but. Hell yeah. So the JH Diesel and 4x4. That's it. Dang. Those are actually limited edition. We only made like three of those. So oh, shoot. very rare. That one, I, I had to search for that one. I lost it, but I found it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> it looks like you've made it quite a while ago. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. It doesn't say JH who. Uh, maybe I'll put it on the back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just write it and mark it on the back. <laughs> I'll put it on the back. That was the best marketing strategy you've ever had. That was like, I mean, thanks to you. <laughs> like, I mean, it was like. I was like, God, they got me on that one, but it's been great. I mean, we made merch for it and everything. It's been awesome. It blew up. <laughs> a late night, um, that was, it's, it's the classic, like, you ask Chris to do things, and you have to, like, force him to do things, and I called him up, like, I think the <laughs> night before we went to Cletus when and Cars he, that I needed big stickers that said it. Crispy is already, like, so stressed, and he's got so. 10 million things. Yeah, yeah, I'll get it done. I'll get it done. You sure? Yeah, yeah, I'll get it done, and he does it. <laughs> Yeah, he was over here filming my, like, little interview deal like he did with you, mm -hmm. talking about things. He was like, yeah. I was like, what do I do? He's like, I don't know. JH talked for, like, nine minutes. I was like, what does that tell me? <laughs> <laughs> what, do I, what do I talk uh, about? Because I'll just start rambling on Yeah, him. I he was, was like, I just kind of start rambling sometimes. Just make something like, you know what? Use what you use. You can edit it. You're an editor. Just do it, okay? <laughs> Which is the worst, because editing, like, talking <laughs> sucks. Yeah. Editing, like, a car racing, like, if you edit, like, a drag race, you're like... You can look at the thing, and you're like, click, 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 out, yep. done deal. Well, you don't edit anymore. You got a guy for that now. I wish. Oh, he's still, you still edit? No, I do all the, um, so I do all the editing. So I do less mechanic work now, actually, because I can have him back there all day. And he works, you know, okay. all day. He is, Justin is awesome. Like, if it was not for him, our channel would be nowhere near where it is. And even before I could even pay him, he was still just helping. He wouldn't take money. I'm like, mm -hmm. Trying to buy him stuff, like I can at least buy you dinner and pay for your hotels. At least I feel like I'm helping a little bit, you know. But <clears throat> um, he um, he can be back there all day working on stuff, and then he might film a little bit, do some time lapse stuff. Because a lot of the big projects we do, it's a lot of we do a lot of time lapse because yeah. I mean we're building stuff or we're doing something like a big project, and so um, he'll stay working. I'll go back there for 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour help, and I'm back up front dealing with the shop, and then. He'll airdrop me everything at the end of the day. Then I go in and I edit at night is normally how it goes. I'll either edit first thing in the morning or at night, and then that's usually how it goes. Pulling the old Cletus McFarlane routine there, you know? Show up for 10 minutes, you know? <laughs> hey, guys, I've been working all day. <laughs> yeah, no. I, Zach's in the back all dirty. Like. Yeah. <laughs> today, I actually, I don't know if you can smell it. I took a diesel bath today. We were working on a truck, and I literally go to, it was bad. Like, I still... After showering, I'm still covered in diesel fuel. It doesn't come off. Yeah, it might be the worst fluid. It's it's, it's a close one to like diff oil. Yeah, I got it in my armpit, in my ear, because it mm. sprayed me, and I was like, oh. and so I'm like, this arm's very well lubricated. This one, 
Not so much right now. Ethanol will get you when you're like doing this, and then it just like runs down your. Is arm. that really? Is it burn? I don't know what ethanol yeah, does. Ethanol burns. burns. Yeah. yeah. If you got any like, it's it's basically rubbing alcohol. Yeah. Um, during COVID, all the companies that made like ethanol and stuff started making like Purell alcohol, and Purell, like, yeah. Yeah, like yeah. hand sanitizer because yeah. it was an easy like switch and you're like, oh, it's just a <laughs> it's close just alcohol. <laughs> yeah, they just made it a little thicker, I guess, or something. <laughs> but it's pretty funny that they can they can switch so quickly. Um, do you like you've always had a lot of like hobbies in the in the dirt and mud and like side by side? Yeah. Is it tough now? Like, do you feel like some stuff... As far as just for fun? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it does suck. I mean, it does suck, but it doesn't because used to be a lot more... I used to have a lot more time, but, like, leading up to before I hired Justin full-time, that was the worst because we were working, like, every night after work, and then I would have to make my weekends. we like, hey, we can do eight hours on a Saturday or Mm -hmm. 10 hours, whatever. Like, let's do it. Oh, Sunday's the only day. Now we have a little bit more time. I'm a lot freer now. But, yeah, I mean, doing events, as you know, it's like, you know, especially when our season kicks off, I try to do the burnout events. I try to do the races. Mm-hmm. Everything kind of it, – it's difficult to try to to do that and to go out on my side-by-side, go to River Ranch, stuff like that. Yeah, because everything – all the events are a weekend. Yeah. So, like, you get 52 weekends a year. Yep, and, and 30 of them are weekends, and, you know, yeah. or we are events, you know. Yeah, 30 and, of them and, are events that you really want to go to, and then – Because we have, like, a mud bogging season, which is, like, January – to May is like mud bogging season. And then it ends in May. June, Ju- June there was like usually one, but July, August, September, it's dead. October, it kicks back off. So like October, November, it's busy again. So you've got like six, seven months out of the year that are mud events. Yeah. And then on top of those, of course, you have your Cletus and Cars events. And then we've got truck pulls that happen and dirt drags and just all these other random events to fill in. And before you know it, you're at 30, 40 events a year and you get... 10 weekends home you yeah know? i know because so. even like with all of us when like i think about simple things like oh i gotta schedule a wedding yeah because you're like well i need a weekend but it also can't overlap with everything that everybody i know does yep. because we all need a weekend it's super difficult <laughs> it's really difficult to plan stuff that's why like i literally try to plan things like six months in advance and there's always stuff that pops up and um, I just called Alan. I'm like, hey, when's next year's Cletus and Cars? Because he knows, you know. Yeah. And he's like, it's on this day. I said, yep, that's what I thought. I got to miss that event, but I'll be the, you know, whatever. So so I just want to make sure before we do it, you know, but I do, I, I actually have like a calendar now and we try to organize everything for the year. So. Yeah, it's tough to do. It's like, it, yeah. it, and things come up quickly. Like yeah. Bristol will be here before you know it. Oh. If you don't have a running vehicle yet, well, you I know, pretty much you know, just, just rebuilt it in the parking lot last year. I worked on it for like we, me and Justin worked on it for like twelve hours last year, the mm-hmm. first day, because it didn't run. We just sent it. We're like, you know, it's not done, but we'll get it done. We always manage to get it done, but I do everything last minute. Yeah. I can start working on it now, and the events in three months. The night before, I will be working on something. It doesn't matter. I don't know why it just happens that way, but it just does. So, mm-hmm. I know even before, because um, we all came on here before the last event in Indy. Yep. And that was a crazy deal to have everybody that had a bunch of shit to do. <laughs> yeah, we did. It was like, yeah, I remember that. I was like, well, this week's going to be crazy, but I got to go. I'll, I'll be there. So. Yeah. Well, Garza was like, I was like, oh, come on before Indy. And he was like, okay, cool. And then I was like, if you want to bring anybody else on too, like Parker or JH or something, and he was like, all right. And then he was like, Oh, Garrett's coming too. I'm like, <laughs> wait, kinda, what? <laughs> kind of makes it a bigger episode. Yeah, like, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, <laughs> but let's, all right, let's do it. Not that so. I couldn't reach out to him myself, but hey, yeah. Garza wanted to do the scheduling for the podcast. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Garza, you know, he's a good dude. Garza will definitely, he's a good dude. Let's just put it that way. We'll leave yeah. it at that. He does a hell of a burnout. <laughs> he does a hell, I mean, the walls love him. I mean, let's just put it that way. He's definitely a fan favorite for sure. Yeah. I enjoy watching them. I love it. It's like, when is it going to happen? Up, oh, up, oh, up. Oh, there it is. It's... Indy, Indy Wall took out a lot of cars. <sighs> a lot yeah. of cars. Indy, in Indy. was it Indy? Um, Most recently, where me, I hit the wall. Garrett hit the wall in toast. Pretty good. Oh, which that's is right. Not a that's right. Super uncommon thing. Um, Gars, <laughs> I think, hit the wall. I uh, did pretty good. I won Indy. I did really good in Indy. I was, I was actually very happy yeah. with Indy. The worst was yeah, last year. Plumber's crack hit the wall pretty good. He bent a tie rod or something. The worst was last year's Bristol. It was bad. Everything was getting totaled. Mm. Like, it was bad. This year they made the pad a lot bigger, apparently. But last year it was very small. But it had a huge tip in. And, like, I tipped in my Dodge so hard I actually bent the frame on it. 
Oh. I came around and swung it around, and the rear smacked the wall. And, like, I don't know, a week later, I was, like, looking at it, and I'm like, oh, it just bent the bumper. And I start looking. I'm like, no, it twisted the whole, like, the bed hit the cab on that side. <laughs> oh, like, well, shoot. Well, this thing's totaled. <laughs> yeah. And you've um you've done a couple of your own burnouts where you kind of, like, host them for other things, which yep. is a cool deal to be able to it was pretty awesome. Be on the other side of it. It's pretty awesome. Like, I had a, a buddy of mine reach out, which I'd known him, and we developed a relationship through the truck world, and he wanted me to come do the truck stuff. He's like, I want you to run our burnout contest, and I did it awesome. And um, But uh, he does a huge truck event, which is great. And uh, so it's really cool to go do that, and I would do, like, an exhibition run. I wouldn't enter the contest. I would just do an exhibition run and then, what you know, fire everybody up, and then they would come out and rip, and it yeah. was just – everybody really threw down when they were able to do that it was cool was it a good deal up there in daytona it was daytona was awesome i mean that was you know he's had some trouble since uh he went down to miami to homestead speedway and it wasn't really the same now yeah. he's going back to orlando this coming year and to uh, osw uh it's uh yeah he's going to speed world they're oh, doing sweet. it there they're gonna do like diesel drag racing they're gonna do he's trying to do more of a like an event like an event than just a show yeah so you can have the show which is kind of how it started but now that he's able to get these locations where they want to do like a drag race or a truck pull he's doing tug of wars burnout all that stuff so. i love to see that i love to i like to be able to shout out events that are doing good things too yep. I, I like that and uh, like people that are promoting good events because i like to see them flourish and yep. do well if like a event promoter kind of deserves it like somebody like victor yes constantly exactly. deserves Victor's constantly putting i mean that's that guy is insane i yeah. mean big props to him he's he's made our track just it's like the best in the, the nation I it mean, is the mecca it's between garrett and victor it is the mecca of automotive absolutely and with garrett kind of branching out like i know they have i don't think he's talked about it too much but they have the swap meet coming up and yep. like a cars and coffee and open track nights like yep. Stuff that's stuff kind of that, a little different. Stuff that anybody can get involved in. Yeah. You don't have to come out there and have a car. Like, you can go out there and have a car that's a stock Corvette or a stock Camaro or whatever, or just an older car that you want to go show off, and you can come and join it and be a part of it. It's awesome. I think people don't realize that about the drag strip either. Is like, it doesn't matter what car you have. Nope. And honestly, if you have just a slow stock car, that's what you should go out there and, and learn. learn. Learn how, how a light, tree works learn, yep. and... That's what we did. Where I the mean, turnoff is we, and stuff. Like the day I got my driver's license, I had like a Chevy pickup truck. And I mean, it was for the first couple of years, every Thursday, we were the drag strip for test yeah. and tune. And like, it was like, I would literally go run my truck almost every Thursday, pay the, t back then it was, it was five bucks or 10 bucks you could run. And Dang inflation. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so, and so I go run the truck and they would, you know, the guys at the track back then, sorry guys, they loved us. Not really. We'd be having leaves blow out of the truck I and mean, we were just whatever mud fall off when we yeah. go in the burnout box Dirt and they're just like, off. we come back up. They're like, you're done for the night. Go back. Like, just go hang out mm -hmm. by the fence. Cause we're not cleaning up after you again. But because uh, we literally go mud our truck Sunday, wash them, and then, oh, Thursday's the track, let's go. Mm -hmm. But it was really cool. Like, my truck ran like a 17, not fast at all, but for a truck on 37s. Well, especially was back then was actually was a good bit faster not, than now. Yeah, not bad. But but regardless, like, it wasn't the fastest thing. But then you met, even if you're racing another guy with a 17-second truck, it's just fun because you are racing, and it's super fun mm -hmm. to go out there, support your local track. You can take anything that's street legal out there or some things not street legal, just as long as it's safe. And I'd love to see like um like a first time free like a first time's free type of thing for the yeah. drag strip would be cool. That'd be cool. And then even like um maybe like a buddy system program, like, oh I've never been to the track before. You can post it up and like what Somebody was, that has been could kind of like show your really, into it a little really bit. Really cool, and I'd never seen this before. When we went to the Ultimate Callout Challenge this year, do you know what that is? Um, yeah, explain it a little it's, bit though. It's just a massive diesel event. They have a huge show and shine. They've yep. got a ODSS comes out and does a huge drag race. They do a dyno. That's where you see like the motors that go that to the moon literally explode on the dyno. Yeah. So, they, so the ultimate pistons call, hit so, the walls that are <laughs> yeah. a mile away. So yeah, so the Ultimate Callout Challenge is. It started out as it consists of three three events. One truck, three events. You'd have to drag race, do a dyno, and do a sled pull. And they still do that event. That's where all the big high horsepower trucks are. But now they've made that event much bigger where now it's like, all right, let's go and just do fun runs. Or we're going to do an ODSS points race, which yeah. is um, uh, it's a D 
diesel, it's a diesel drag racing series, basically. So um, it was really cool to go out there and do that. And uh, I don't know where I was going with that, but... About new people going new to the people. track. So, yeah. yeah. So we get done with the driver's meeting. They says, has anybody never raced before? And oh, there's like nice. six or seven guys that came up and they said, look, we're going to give you this guy. He'll be a coach. He's going to teach you what to do when you get up to the tree. He'll go up there with you. He'll tell you what to do. So they took like six or seven drivers. And it was really cool to watch, you know, where they took them and said, hey, like these guys always run the ODSS. They're running, you know, sub sevens or eights, whatever it is, second quarter miles or yep. running Pro Street. And they're running, um, you know, the the Pro Mod stuff. And they're helping the guys that have never done it before. That's awesome. So it was really cool to see that. Yeah, happen. First I like time that. I saw that. Because drag racers, we get into this thing where we gatekeep for some reason, where you're like, stop it. Like, you're like getting on the new guy. Like, yeah, yeah. It's his first time. First Let time, him yeah. in. Mm-hmm. They do this. Um, I can't think of the name of the guy, but up in uh, Clearwater, they have, like, rentals where you can go for, like, a day, and they have, like, two Mustangs that are almost the same, and you could go with a group of people, rent the cars, and they'll, like, show you the, like, drag, the strip. drag strip. Yeah, take oh, you down cool. the track and stuff, and, like, okay. it's kind of a cool program because Absolutely. you can go as, like, a party, like how you'd go go-karting with yep. a group of people. Yep, and then you're running pretty much the same car, so then you're like, ah, I want faster time than you. It gets yeah. people competitive and gets them into it. Because mm-hmm. I mean, it's it get, it gets them into the racing part, which is awesome. Even what Garrett's doing with selling ability to go race a Crown Vic is really yep. cool. Yep, you could probably do the same for a drag strip too with a Crown Vic. It wouldn't be. You really could. I mean, even if you had like a, a let's say you did like a you know thirteen second car or something, you know, and said, hey, you know, it's a pretty reliable car. We'll do two of those, and you know, like let's say you went and bought a Mustang or a Camaro or something that did okay, and just mm-hmm. have them running like the cars aren't really going to break. I mean. They're going to last forever doing that. And that would be really cool to do, like, an experience like that. Just make it loud. Make it, like, an experience going down the track. Yep. I, th- I think be, that's um, it's a big part of the track is getting new people into it. And older people often are bad at that. Yeah. They are actually the opposite of, yeah, <laughs> like, they, like uh, they they don't like when new people <laughs> show up, which is a crazy like, you're mindset. you our sport, but no, they're, they're just the new generation. You got to teach them. We dealt with that so much in the early burnout stuff. Really? Because we would do it kind of at the track, and people, people would just hate like, it. Yeah, they'd be like, "Oh, this should be a regular event," and we're like, "Well, yeah, but the regular event doesn't fill the stands." Yeah, exactly. So yeah. you can go complain to the track that we're hosting a burnout contest here, and there's all these people. Honestly, people don't realize. I realized, you know, doing a burnout event and actually going out there and winning a burnout event event in my opinion is just as hard if not more difficult than drag racing than mm-hmm. circle track racing like you have to build a car that builds a certain amount of power that will blow the tires off in a certain amount of time that will not overheat it's got to drive off the pad it's got to pop the tires got to do all this stuff and hopefully make it to the next one people don't realize like it is a serious you guys went to australia and stuff and saw the real deal over yep. there and we're getting that now over here. There's so many more burnout competitions popping up, which I think is awesome. And uh, I don't care who's putting them on as long as they're good events. And people don't see that how much work. I mean, I blew up a lot of engines doing burnouts. It sucks. But I'm, I've learned every step of the way. And I'm doing kind of on, I'm kind of doing something nobody's done. You know, the diesel stuff. There's a few out there, but nobody that's been like the horsepower level where yeah. I was at, where I'm trying to make that work. And it. People love the black smoke. Like, oh, they love they it, man. love that. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah, my 6.0, when it would come out, it was, that truck was, it was badass. 6.0s have a pretty great they sound to sound, them, too, yeah. that, like, you you can't not, like, you can't ignore that yeah. sound. Like, Duramaxes, they don't, eh, they don't mm-hmm. really have that same sound, but. Yep, the Cummins, the Dur- then the Duramax, they don't have. You can make a Duramax close to it, but the Cummins have just a totally separate sound to, like, a single turbo yeah. 6.0. And it just has this raspy, just, you guys know what I'm talking about. There's something great about it. Yeah, it's That's awesome. that whistling sound <laughs> yeah. that it has to it. It's a, it's a pretty it's a pretty good sound. The um, the thing about Australia that we don't have here yet, which is wild, their contest will always be better, is when I went to Sydney Dragway for the Test and Tune, they were drag racing, and then they had a Test and Tune burnout pit. Really? Like, was ready to go. You could do either. And that is why they will have better burnouts because if you want to test a burnout you can you uh, yeah you yeah. can you can you I have could, the ability if i have to yeah yeah but they just that is just a normal thing you can That's go with crazy. any car like drag racing whatever you got 
You it pull out that, there. Hey, Victor, it wouldn't be that hard to do. Just put a little test and tune burnout out there, you know? It was just, like alongside <laughs> the track, just how indie was. Just normal. Just that's cool. That's that actually makes sense. I didn't know they did that over there, but yeah. that's, you know, that's that's really cool. I got to ride a, I got to ride in like a 1500 horsepower methanol burnout car for the first time there and the tip in was just insane it was pretty nuts yeah my first tip in alongside a drag strip was pretty cool and sydney dragway is one of the most beautiful tracks ever too yeah um you were down with uh uncle chet how was that uncle chet his house is pretty sweet down there his house is sick his setup is insane like it's super hot in arizona right now it's another it's like 110 115 yeah. where he's at so we only stayed at his house for like, uh, I think a day or two nights or something. And then we went to his cabin and up in the, the mountains and it was like nice. 60 degrees, 70 degrees at night and like maybe 80 or 90 during the day. But um, yeah, his house is sick. I mean, like you, yeah, it was. Cause we've all always told him like, oh, when are you gonna move to Florida? And then you go out there and you're like, ah, I yeah, get it. I get it's it, pretty man. good setup. Well, like we go out there and I'm like, what do you do right now? Cause Chet's like, he's kind of retired a little bit, but he's not. Yeah. And he's like, normally just, you know, hang around. Buy some Pokemon cards dude, or yeah, something. Dude, like, hang around, do some baseball, Pokemon cards. But he's got a bunch of slot machines in this house now he bought. So he was he was staying at my house. The house always wins, man. He, yeah. He, he, I'm like, oh, I go to play him. I'm like, they're like, you actually have to put quarters. And I said, I'm not giving you quarters. Do you guys have any, like, a machine you can give me some quarters? Like, yeah, no, open you, from the back or no, something? No, you have to just play with your money. I'm like, no, I'm not doing it, dude. No way. Because you don't win anything. Yeah. So it, it was it was very fun out there. We had a great time. Um, I mean, his house, he's like, I wish, because he's like, I wish I could go to Florida. And he's like, I just want to move my house. I love my house so much. And the lake and that said, he's on. That's... Yeah, the lake is awesome. So, yeah, that's a good yeah. spot down there. And then you guys were out filming. Where were you filming that deal? It was in um, Sedona. So there's like a big rock crawling. There's like a, it's actually really cool. It's open to the public. You can literally drive your, your Duramax out there and just, off-road if you want like you can drive whatever you yeah. want and there's different trails where you can go smaller trails but um we went out to the sedona um i don't know what it was called just off-road trails off-road park and the first time i've ever done like rock crawling like really on rocks i've done yeah. like some hill climbs stupid stuff like that where there's like rock traction instead of like gravel absolutely it's straight rock like you're coming up some of the stuff and it's true like yeah it's, it's honestly was really fun like could I was, you like, see like you know kind of like a trail ish from like you know tires maybe or something or was it cause some some of the stuff so like there was like this main trail that everybody follows and then there'd be like little stuff where it'd branch off we ended up and i was like i bet you can't do that where there's no tire marks and sure enough we get stuck doing that stuff <laughs> or like one of the things was we came up and it was just like pretty much straight up and down and you would loop around and you would go down it chet's go i said chet's like we should go up it and i'm like no nah, i don't really think we should and he goes now nah, we're going up and he gets in the little via cross and He's ripping up it, and people are watching now. All the trails stopped. Everybody's like, "What's going on?" And and then he's bouncing off the ground, and then I hop in the 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 Pajero, and I was driving that, and I'm like doing it too. And they're just like, "Oh my god, what are these guys doing?" Like they're in their jeeps, and they're just like, yeah, like looking, trying to look over their ducks on their dash, and they're yeah, trying to see yeah. what we're doing. And <laughs> so everybody was like, "Holy crap!" Like these guys are sending, it. and we're just like, "Yeah, I mean, we're." We're gonna try this stuff in out. Two things that look yeah. like they should not be trying anything. One of the things it was the weirdest thing because we had to come over this hill and it was a left hand thing, which in a I was driving a right hand vehicle, so everybody else is in the left hand drive. Yeah. So you can see the hill, and I'm like coming up it, and I'm like, oh my god, like I can't see anything right now. I'm driving this thing off the side of a mountain because a lot of it, if you screw up, I mean, it is literally you're going down hundreds of feet. It's mm -hmm. insane. Just a different, it's a, it In was, a 90s, 80s JDM vehicle. <laughs> yeah. Very safe. Yeah, <laughs> super safe. I mean, and it, it was really cool though, because I've never done it. And the terrain out there was honestly, it was beautiful. Like you look out, yeah. Arizona was beautiful in the mountains. It was awesome. It is a good, it, from what I've seen, it seems pretty awesome out there. And some of like the sunsets with all the, oh, the yeah. colors that they get in there yep. and stuff. Yeah. I, you, you have to see it to, and you know. You see it in the movie or you see it whatever. You got to mm -hmm. go there and see it in person to see it because you respect it a lot more. It's just yeah. everything is. And, like, we're filming the rock crawling and stuff, and I'm like, you know that, like, the one hill that we climbed up, it is literally straight up and down almost. I mean, it's – and it's – you shouldn't take anything up it. And we're over here doing it, and it's like the camera just looks like we just drove up a hill. Mm -hmm. It was so – in person, it's way different. It doesn't give you the – it. the camera definitely doesn't do it justice. It doesn't do it justice You need all. to, like – 
for something like that, you almost need to really upgrade your camera equipment yep. just to get like something that really can show what's going on, like an IMAX. I have a Pro Max. <laughs> My iPhone's a Pro Max. The, the so iPhones do pretty it's damn a Pro good. Max. <laughs> But yeah, you need something like an IMAX <laughs> yeah. type of thing. Yeah, an IMAX. <laughs> 70 millimeter, something real high mm. level. It um, Sometimes out there it seems interesting because if you don't have like a level on your car, you can get dis discoordinated 100%. what you're doing because you're like up against the wall, but you're like, wait, which is up? What is sideways? Sometimes we're like going and we're like going up and then like we're literally like come down. But even though we're coming down, we're, we're like flat. Yeah. But you're still going. It's weird. Like you have. To, it's really tricky to know. It messes the with the senses a little bit. It does. It does. It's pretty cool. It was. It was cool. There's a lot of uh, elevation changes on the trails that we went on. So that mm -hmm. was really cool. Did it feel weird not going wide open throttle like you're normally used to? Absolutely. Because even in like side Absolutely. by siding, it is a wide open throttle type of type yep. of deal. It was definitely more technical, but it was something I've never done. I, I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna like it or not. I actually liked it. It was super, super cool. I had a lot of fun. Do you think you're going to get a new uh, Can-Am when they come out? I don't know, man. I know they're just kind of talking about them they've a little been, bit. I saw been, some photos. They've been pre-releasing the new photos, which are look not very good. Like, I was like, eh. But, you know what? Hey, you know, they're, they're doing what they're doing. But I love my Can-Ams. I've always had Can-Ams. I've had, I think, five now. And um, I've, I've had super good luck with all my stuff. Like, we have a couple problems here and there, but it's mostly self-induced. If it's broken, yeah. it's probably because of me. Well, they so, definitely had a defective frame. Yes. They definitely had that. I actually feel really had bad. that? Like, they have still that. have the same Maybe frame. the new one doesn't. The, the problem is, I think they do it, um, I could be wrong, but it's it's almost stupid the way they do it. Um, they don't, I don't see what the reason is. Like, in my opinion, if you build something that does 80 miles an hour, you should be able to have that thing flip at 80 miles an hour and not be totaled. You know, like in my opinion, it's a fast roll. Well, but in an off-road vehicle with a roll yeah. cage and stuff, like you should be able to rebuild it. Anything could happen. Don't yeah. get me wrong. Yeah, it should. Like but, the center structure should be good. You're well, gonna like rip drag, off control like arms car. and you, stuff. You know, like people crash it. You know, 150 mile an hour hit the wall. But now they just cut the front off and put a new. If they yeah. made it that easy, then I would be like, okay, that's cool. That's you know. But they weld the cage is welded. You have to put an aftermarket cage on it. The frames tweaked. I mean. There's just there's not much that you can do without and their cage material isn't oh. isn't confidence inspiring. I almost I actually almost I almost died on a can am from a cage collapsing. Hmm. I rolled I rolled my OG Maverick. Uh I, I we were on a track and I got hit. I I hit a guy's tire in front of me and going up the face of a jump and my machine just goes like this. So I'm literally in the air flying and I look over and I'm like looking at the ground, I'm like, oh my god, this is gonna be really bad. Knocked me out, crushed the whole cage on my head. And so, like, I didn't know who I was, where I was. I had a, that was one of the last concussions mm -hmm. I had. That was a really bad one. That was the worst. And um, so, like, of course, in my fashion, I cut the cage off, wrote, wrote it with no cage for a few months. I mean, Even more danger. It was <laughs> <laughs> expert level danger. Yeah. But, uh, but no, I mean, just to have something, and whenever I cut that cage off, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, you were talking back in like, you know, 2000, probably 16 to 18 that time. And I was like, I can't believe they would have a cage this thin. Like, yeah. this is, I could have died. Like, yeah. I could have been killed, you it know? Definitely is not very sturdy. It, it's weird with side by sides because I wonder what's escalated worse in the last 10 years is truck costs or side by side costs. Like, if you put the graphs together, like, did side by side Costs. I think they're about the same. I mean, I think I just saw where like a new Polaris Razor is like forty five thousand dollars. That's crazy for a Polaris Razor, like something that you are literally just taking and beating the shit out of constantly. Um, they and priced like their demographic out of the market in a way. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 just. But we want them to be that good. <laughs> we do, but the problem is they're not. Like they're okay, but yeah. if like you know, like it, it could be better. I think like whenever I buy my X three. Instantly, I got to put radius arms on it. I know I'm going to bend the factory ones. I got to put control arms on it. I know I'm going to bend the factory ones. I put a roll cage on it because I know if I flip it, I want to be safe. Yeah. Harnesses go in it. Good harnesses. So you spend another twenty grand. Yeah, it's it's not twenty. I think it was like six six grand, eight grand. Plus, you doing the work. Plus me doing the work. Yeah. And you know, so I mean, but and there's other wheels, guys that do a tires. Lot more. Yeah, wheels, tires, know. and that's always something I can't really count the wheels and tires because even like when you have a truck. Normally, you want to put aftermarket wheels. It'd be cool if you could get like a body in white, basically, like kind of like they used to sell Camaros 
and Mustangs, like you get like a body in white where it's like a shell and you could just like kind of put your own motor in it. Like it has oh, no really? like suspension know, and stuff. I didn't know they did that. I didn't know that. Yeah, That's they, cool. they didn't have titles though. So oh, they like were like the drag cars, like the but Coco? they came bare bones, nothing, no motors, nothing. Yeah. yeah. But like if you could get like, it kind of shows up on a pallet with like no wheels, tires, control arms. So you like, like, oh, just it's a, 20 grand cheaper. 100%. And there's no cage this, on it already. I'm like, change all this anyways. We might as well, you know. Like that'd de-option be, them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like just bring it without axles already. I think part already. of that is like uh, the reason they won't do it is probably lawsuit wise somebody goes and sure. i built my own roll cage out of pvc pipe and it didn't hold up you know mm-hmm. i think that's probably part of that i saw some guys on youtube they were gonna do one out of titanium that seemed crazy titanium yeah sounds very expensive yeah well <laughs> wait you know and once wait. you start talking about racing i don't know how strong titanium is I it's don't not know. those guys on youtube are questionable i don't know who the guys are did i miss them <laughs> oh <laughs> i think it was guys, i think it was doug those and guys are sketchy <laughs> <laughs> i think well titanium doesn't doesn't bend either yeah like it it doesn't like it just kinks or what's it it kind of just kinks yeah because it's super brittle and very what are they hard. putting a titanium cage i on? think they were trying to a while ago but i don't know yeah. if they ever did because they yeah. were trying to make a real race unit where it's just straight up for probably racing. beast mode where it's just for like yeah going fast as possible and if you can take i think people don't realize that it's the same with like a dirt bike or like the lighter the vehicle is and you could take 10 pounds off is That's huge. A lot. That's a lot. Like 10 pounds off my car isn't huge. It's not. But, but 10 pounds off a side by side is pretty well, big. Side by side, I think, weighs like 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. And you took off, you know. 10 pounds in the right area. That's huge. Mm-hmm. That's big. You know, like it's that's a lot. I'm interested with those new upright arms that go over the wheel. Yeah. I, I, that's and be and weird. I don't know. And the problem is, is. I don't know if those pictures are, are, they're looking very legit, but I don't know if they are. You know, nobody knows. I've seen a few people post it, mm-hmm. but I mean, we'll find out here. I think they release it in the next week or two. I think we find out in a couple weeks. I bet you uh, David knows, uh, what's his name uh, in Canada? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's a big Can-Am guy, right? Yeah, I think yeah. he's like in their website and on their commercials and stuff too. Yeah. I, I don't Oster, know if they, you know, yeah, that's it. I don't know if they do or not, though. I don't know if they're allowed. I think they go to the dealer show. I know, like, I'm friends with, uh, which is totally different. Don't get me wrong. Um, I'm friends with um, uh, own, uh, owner of our local shop, and he's goes to the Can Am dealer shows every year, and he knows nothing until he goes. He's like, I only get what they tell me, yeah, and it's like nothing. They're so tight lipped on it all. So isn't it weird how big of a gap there is between the Can-Am and the Razor and then like every other side by side on the market? Like it seems yeah. like there's a huge divide in like performance. I mean, there is because you're talking guy. The, these are your t- but it's kind of like, I don't know. I mean, it, I think everybody will eventually catch up, but you have to look at it as kind of uh, they're the two. That's their focus. Their focus mm-hmm. is supercharging something, turbocharging something. Like, you look at their jet skis for Bombardier or, Can- or yeah. their other sister company, at Can-Am, or the same company. All their jet skis are insanely fast. And then you got other ones that are like, eh, they're, they're okay. But, like, Honda has always been known to be super reliable, but not the fastest, but super reliable. That's why you get a Honda generator and a Can-Am side yeah, by side. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, you got companies like that. And then uh, I don't know what other company. I mean, you got like CF like the Motors KRX. Trying. The KRX was again though. You know, you're you're gen- there's your kind of your. But like they production. thought it would be a sport unit. They did, man. That they were like, was, oh, Can Am's done. Was, yeah, that <laughs> was, done. I remember seeing the first one. This is the size of my car, like my truck. This thing's huge. What am I gonna do with this thing with a hundred horsepower? Yeah. Like, this is no, like what, this is not the way to go. And uh, yeah, they they do, and I don't know. It's uh, I just they are they are pushing the performance market. That's what Razor and Can-Am do. Um, they are Polaris and Can-Am. They push the performance market. They're, they're, they're your top guys. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's back in the that day. they're going away from turbos, too. Are they going like, more to supercharge? I don't know. It seems like they're going to, like, NA and supercharge. Like, because... The Razor did, um, but then they still have turbo models. I don't know... But they went to big four-cylinder instead did. of turbo... Whatever, two and or I've three. seen the prelim stuff on the new Can Am. It's still a three cylinder engine with a turbo, but now they that's like a jet ski. But now, yeah, but now they mount it like a jet ski, like a car. Mm-hmm. They're mounting the engine 
where cylinders front to back instead of sideways. Yeah, like longitudinal so, yep. type so of I'm deal. I'm curious to see how that works. Mm -hmm. From what I've seen, if these pictures are legitimate, it's got that with now a gear to gear transmission or a DCT transmission. Yeah. It doesn't have a, um, there's no more belt from what I'm seeing. That would be nice, even though the belts have been pretty proven. I'm, the, you know, and, and like to me, you know, I know a lot of guys with Hondas and they break low gears a lot. They're pretty common for breaking the low gear mm -hmm. and they have to take the whole trans out, you know, rebuild the whole yep. trans. I'd much rather just break a belt in 15 minutes, change my belt out, and I'm back on the trail. It's a good fail deal. point, especially a, on the yeah. new ones. Like, yeah. if we're talking about, like, a Maverick where it's, like, eight hours to fix. <sighs> yeah, Maverick, OG Mavs were. <laughs> but, like, a new Can-Am, right. people are like, ah, oh, whatever. Yep, just like, you know, it's like they made it easily accessible where you could just change it. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, just another thing that I guess can fail. So if they have it figured out, I mean, a company like that should have it figured out where they've seen Honda do theirs, they've seen other companies do theirs can't be that hard to make something hold up yeah so um to switch on this i know i saw a post a while back on parts quality on oh. things just disappeared from me just in what you get in your shop like yeah. you know like i I've made heard of it post. with like head studs you know people are like open a kit and they're like two of these aren't threaded yeah like what yes what's going on here it's insane <laughs> and man. they're like oh you actually can't get just two yeah <laughs> But like things like that. We've had more comebacks in the past probably two or three years from part failures than anything than any in the past fourteen years I've been open. OEM or aftermarket. Doesn't parts, matter. Both. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, you know, and then they'll literally be like, Oh yeah, well we kinda had this happen. I'll be like, What do you mean you had this happen? Why don't you tell me this? You know, like You had it happen again. <laughs> but the problem was was when, you know, back to COVID, I hate to go back to that, but when that happened parts were so hard to get and manufacture <clears throat> this company was shutting down for a while this company was shutting down for a while so these other companies said we don't want to stop production we need to get it so let's get it from wherever we can mm -hmm. so their quality went down and i see that a lot in automotive parts where we're changing you know we'll, we'll get a brand new motorcraft part and it's bad we'll get a brand new delco part put it on and it's bad i mean i'm seeing that so much and it's killing the shop you know like it, it's it's not killing us we have so much work it's not a big deal but I just had a, uh, a 6 0 power stroke. We did a cam and head job, a bunch of work on, and got the customer, got it back, probably drove it 500 miles. Came back, the engine was locked up. And we did head studs and we did the engine. Yeah. The glow plug that we put in, Motorcraft glow plug, failed, fell in the cylinder, and bounced around in there. So, mm -hmm. guess who eats that? I called Ford. I said, hey, you know, the glow plug. They said, well, you need to send it to a dealership and we'll figure it out. And I'm like, I'm not sending it to a dealership. So I guess who fixes that on their yeah. dog? Me. You know, destroy the to piston. A dealership. That'll work out great. Yeah, they'll come back and be like, well, you didn't torque it properly or something. You know, and we're very good about that at the shop. My guys are good. They torque everything. They're not. Nothing is half-assed because I tell them I would much rather spend an extra hour on this job than have a comeback. And now we're eating thousands of dollars. Yeah. And so yeah, like it just basically fell apart. And this is a motorcraft part. I'm seeing it with Ford, I'm seeing it with GM, I'm seeing it with Delco, you know, Mopar, I'm seeing it with all of them, all the aftermarket brands. It sucks, but the quality has gone down yeah. tremendously. Well, a lot of them outsource to companies like Moog or something like yep. that. Like we they, buy a lot of Moog parts. Moog they, parts. They've done good. I've used a lot of their parts. Moog parts are very good, and then I've got people now telling me they're having a lot of problems with Moog parts. I haven't seen a huge problem with them, but I have had some people saying uh, in that industry, like, we're seeing more problems with Moog now. And I'm like, well... I haven't seen them yet because when we do something, if like we're doing a front end job on a truck, it's getting either OEM or Moog. I don't do white box brand. Our mm -hmm. shop will not do it. Um, all our parts may, our parts suppliers know we won't. They know like we don't do the cheaper brand because I don't want to deal with comebacks. I rather my customer pay an extra hundred dollars now than dealing with a comeback yeah. down the road. So like if somebody comes in and they're like, oh, can we get the cheaper part? You're like, nope, we don't We don't even entertain it. And we're just like, look, you know, if you're gonna sell, save yourself a hundred bucks. Like, yeah. you know, and some people won't use us for that because we're a little bit more expensive, but I know that I will back that part and say, I did the best I could by putting the best part on there. If it does fail, which it can, anything can fail. I know I tried everything mm -hmm. I could do to make that part work. So to make your vehicle the best it could be and hopefully last the longest. Yeah, that's tough because, you know, there'd be like, oh, I price shopped and it was cheaper here. It's like, yeah, there's a reason. We have a two to four week backup. I tell people all the time, like, well, you can go there. I mean, you know, like it is what it is. And that's not being cocky or being a dick about it. It's my, 
I found being in business, you're never going to please everybody. You're yeah. never going to please everybody. And um, I found being in business for yourself, like you are your brand. So the minute your brand starts to fall off, people are going to quit using you and going to the minute you start getting a repetitive thing where everybody's hating you. And there's been guys that have had shops. I've been in this town for a long time and there's been guys that get that. Um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, thing I don't know get the reputation oh yeah and when you get that reputation it follows you it doesn't stop you yeah. know and so we do everything we can do no matter the parts or whatever we try to push it and make it you know I'd rather somebody use us if we're a little bit more expensive we're a lot more expensive I will back like that guy's engine I'm backing it I'm eating the whole job wasn't my fault but you know what I'm gonna take care of it because I care more about my reputation than just mm -hmm. selling somebody to make a dime at this you know right now so I'm sure you get calls from people that have dealt with a bad job we that do. are now hoping that you can help them and then when you tell them it's a four-week back order that that's tough because like you know we're when I was up at faster problems like you know you can tell somebody okay it's four weeks yeah it's just a cam on their toy yeah you were dealing with like if somebody's four weeks out on their truck that's like they need their trucks tough. that's a huge problem with livelihood us, you know? yeah there's that's a huge issue you know and like you know so so and that's that a lot of these guys make their money with their trucks and i hate yeah. saying it but you know i know other shops and they'll tell people yeah bring it in and then they don't look at it for two weeks yeah. and they're now you got a pissed off customer that wanted his truck looked at i'd rather tell you up front hey man i'm two weeks out but we keep a solid schedule if I book you on this day, your truck will be looked at that day. And that's something I had to learn. I didn't go to business school. I never ran a shop. I didn't have a parent that ran a shop or anything like that. I did all this by myself. So that's something I had to learn. It was huge to learn that. Mm -hmm. And you just learn to tell people. Sometimes you have to tell people no. And sometimes you have to just, I'd rather be honest with them and then them not be mad at me. Yeah, That's the best thing I can do. Be honest with your customer and hopefully they understand. Well, it's like with anything. I don't want to go to a restaurant where no one's there. Yep. <laughs> I don't yeah. trust that. Yeah. I If a fab shop it has nobody there and f wide open schedule, yep. you probably don't trust that either because all the good fab shops right now are going to tell you they're, they're almost a year out. They're busy. Yeah, it's insane. <laughs> so, yeah. like, if something doesn't have people there, that's yep. a that's a red flag. It if is. they quickly I mean, get you in. Yep, we can get you in right away. And sometimes we – now, one thing I've had to adapt to is my crew is very good, and I've had some rockiness, you know, where we're up and down on some mm – -hmm. but now that I have a great crew – we've been able to pack more on the schedule. So there we might have some times where we're like, man, we always have work, but like there might be like where it's like, this is kind of not making us much money or it's a small job, which we're not used to, but mm -hmm. I have to fill in that work where I didn't have to before. So that happens sometimes, yeah. but, or we're waiting on parts, you know, like right now, the average time to wait on an engine is three months minimum, if not more. So mm -hmm. I get a truck in there that used to be done in two weeks. I'm now having that truck in my shop for three to six months. Yeah, Makes things very difficult. Well, like I send a lot of people to Thorpe Superior for sure yeah. because you know if you got like a gas car and need an oil change or need like we send them a lot a of work. belt or we something we don't mess with air conditioning stuff we yeah. just don't we're so busy with the diesels so somebody comes in hey we need AC work we need an alignment go down there see Thorpe and then and they're straight. usually like a same day or next day or whatever yep. like because the gas cars are probably pretty quick to get parts for you you can get a belt in two hours you, like the gas well, stuff is fairly in of, stock that's another thing that a lot of people don't see is Nobody keeps diesel parts in stock. We're lucky our local Ford dealership, they have a massive diesel inventory, which is great. Mm -hmm. Our Chevy dealership, they keep a massive inventory. And our Mopar or Dodge dealership, not really that much. But they're okay, but they can usually get stuff pretty quick. Where I can't just call Advanced Auto Parts and get an injector because, one, it's probably going to be very expensive. And, two, not downing them by any means, but most of their stuff is cheaper as yeah. far as that goes. I'd rather... If I'm putting an injector in your truck, it's either OEM or it's a very well-known performance company that you want a better injector or a bigger injector. Mm -hmm. So, Do the dealerships ever, like, tell you no? Like, if you want a part, like, hey, you guys have it, and they're like, well, we'd like to keep it for our inventory because they're hard to get. Or would you worry about our, anything like that? I haven't like had our dealership. We, we do buy a lot. Because that could happen where, like, they're hoarding parts that they know. We Our dealership's pretty transparent with us because we deal a lot. Like, our Ford, and I think we're... Every t every year we get like a party thrown for, like for us, like a pizza party or whatever. Or like their top three or top five yeah. dealer in our our surrounding area. For their which, dealer, yeah. Sarasota, Bradenton. That's a huge area. So for you to be that, you know, that's pretty good. So 
Um, we're always doing a lot of business with them. So they'll tell me and they'll be like, look, we don't have it, but they'll tell me this dealership says they have two and I will do what I can to get it for you. And they'll make the legwork. They'll call them for me. We have a great relationship with our dealerships because we talk to them every single day. Mm -hmm. There's not one day that goes by. I don't call Ford to get parts or I call, I don't call Chevy to get parts. It's happening every day. And we spend all, you know, it's, when we do it, it's like, you know. Probably a big bill. It's a big bill. You know, diesel parts are not cheap. They're mm -hmm. a lot more expensive than gas parts. And their bays are probably filled with vehicles as well. So it's not like you're taking all their business. I'm not sure they're all. loaded up. Not at all. Because, I mean, we're the parts, to, you know, their parts department has to make money. So, if, you know, that's a completely, I've learned that parts department compared to the the service department is a completely separate department. Yeah. Well, the part, so parts department's going to do what they're going to do. And then your service department's going to do what they're going to do. Do you think dealerships are going to die? Like, I feel like they're on their way down. They are because, I mean... People are I doing direct-to-consumer a lot. I'm not saying they're going to die, but dealerships are going to shrink, I think, because uh, we... You see where you can't just go on a lot now and get a vehicle. They used to have 25 diesel trucks on a lot, loaded high countries or Denali's or, or King Ranches or Lariats, whatever. Now, if you don't order a truck... I mean, I had to order my last truck. They don't have any trucks sitting on the lot. Did lawn. they try to sell it before you got it? They did not. Now, bought, sometimes they will, like, you order it and it's on its way, and then they're, like, calling you up, like, hey, I could sell this for a little bit over MSRP. I heard about guys doing that. Luckily, Porsche, Porsche does that, like, crazy. Do they really? Oh, yeah, if you order one because it's, like, eight months, and then, like, That's some rich crazy. guy comes in, they're like, I want it now. No, luckily, luckily, I, uh, I, I dealt with the same dealership for the past three trucks, and when I order something – they're very good about, hey, you know, like my truck came in. They kept me updated along the way. I got the truck and there was never any like uh, I actually they, they got the truck and they're like, all right, man, we got it. It was like a Saturday. I'm like, look, man, I can't come in till like, I don't know, Tuesday or it was like I was out of town or something. I was like, don't sell that truck. Like, yeah, they're like, no, 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 you're good. And they, they did. They held the truck. Well, they would try out. to offer it like they would try to offer you like, hey, some guy will buy it for over MSRP and we'll give you a kickback. Yeah. And you could end up making a little bit just Absolutely. by like, yeah. I've being heard the of guy that. that had the Ford, deposit down. I think Ford's the worst. Ford's huge on markups and doing that stuff. Ford's like some of the guys are posting the uh, what is it? The market va adjustment. Yeah. And they're like 30 grand. Like the Raptor R I just seen was 211 oh, yeah. grand. Somebody had posted like, come on guys. Like really? Like I get it, but you really hurting that bad. Like that's what you got to do to people. Just sell the thing. You know, do you think your money. truck is worth the cost? Do you think it's worth that money? Or do you think that they're like quality to like what you get for like, that's, you know, uh -huh. you got to look at it as what inflation's done. So it's like, yeah, my truck is in 2005, you could buy a brand new loaded Duramax for 30, you know, 38, 40 grand, 42 grand, brand new. My brother did. My brother yeah. bought one. I think it was like 42 or 45 and they took like five grand off. He ended up getting it for like mm -hmm. 30 or 40 something out the door. You but know? the average salary at that time was probably 29 grand. Yeah, probably 30. You could probably get away with $800 a week or 30 grand, I think, yeah, or but like, 40 grand. Because that's what I was looking at, the average salary at the time versus like the brand new Mac Daddy car. Yep. Even like thinking about it like that. But you also look changed. at how much technology has been put into the truck side. So forced, you, you, forced into it. Yeah, forced into it. A lot it. of it is yeah. forced into it. It is. I mean, it's literally like, you know, but the technology is like huge compared to you getting a 2005 truck and getting a 2024 truck. Yeah. And the technology difference is, I mean, I'm not saying it's the prices are, the prices are where they are. We can't change them. No. People are still going to buy them. You, you just got to deal with it, you know, make more money. That's all I can tell you to do. You know, yeah. like I just... But then you have to doing. raise your prices because everything else goes up, and then you're kind of just playing a catch-up game because you are slower to raise prices on hourly We're wages. Always slower. The fastest guy to do it is a GM executive. Yep. Or It took us a while. It's hard for us to up our labor rate. We actually had to up it last year, and I hated doing it. Um, because, but the problem that we ran into was when we used to get these jobs knocked in and out, like an engine job. They used to be, I think, an engine on a truck, diesel truck. Like a cab off on a 6.0. Yeah, a cab off on a 6.0. Average probably 10 to 14 grand. That's like engine, installation, new injectors, like everything the right way, all the seals, gaskets. Now that same job is like 20000 
just to put an engine in a truck now, if yeah. not more, you know, like, I think I just had one bill for a customer it was 30 grand. We did an engine and a transmission in a six did hours, hours go up a lot too. Like hours of labor. The hours stay the same. Really? Yeah. We run pro demand, which is like, you know, you can look up your hours. Software, yeah. They don't change the hours, but I have to change my labor rate because now where a truck used to be in and out in two weeks, that truck for that engine sat here for three months. So we're not doing the same. Or when I used to order a part from the parts house, I would get that part before in two days sometimes, or I'm sorry, in two hours. Now that same part takes two days, three days sometimes. So yeah. anything that we used to do quickly and get it in and out, that's behind so us So if it hogs a bay. Hogs a bay, you know. And, and it's big. And it's, it's not only that, you know, you're up in your labor rate to keep up with inflation. I gave all my employees raises throughout COVID. I kept all my guys. I never lost a guy through 2020 to 2021, 22. And then I, and then 22 was when I lost a, lost a guy or a couple guys, whatever, during that time. But, um, like I never like, you know, I kept paying my guys more because yeah. I know that, you know, to me, I'd rather pay my guys more. And then, yeah, I do got to up my labor rate, but I know my customers are getting the best. They're getting the best service. They're getting the best quality because I'm taking care of my guys and I want to take care of my guys first. I mean, that's just, that's just how I do things. It doesn't how everybody has to do it, but mm -hmm. I've noticed that, you know, doing that has helped me out tremendously. I'd love to see some of the statistics on um, what, like, like what you went to school for, what the attendance rates have done over the last, like, five years. You know, like, if you're going for, like, a like a school for, like, a trade like that. Yeah. What they've all kind of done, where they've gone to, because, like, maybe the same amount of people are graduating but not getting into the workforce to do that. The problem is, though, you know, it's it's... I see it, you know, I see some guys and like, they will, they, it just, there's just a, I don't know. It seems like there's a lot more dumb people nowadays, no offense to anybody, but I've seen it, you know? And I'm just like, like we were in, when I went to school, like when I went to diesel college, we were like nine months into a program, mm -hmm. nine months into like a two year program. And I'll never forget it. This guy pops the hood of his Tahoe and he points at the alternator and goes, what is that? I'm always wondering what that was. We all were like, what? He came to this school to figure We've it out. We've been here for nine <laughs> months. You don't know what an alternator is? Like, what? Like, Bud, you got to figure something yeah, else out. Like, he ended up dropping out, I'm pretty I sure. I was going to say, he's he on meth now out. somewhere. But, yeah. <laughs> but no, it, it's, you know, and I'm not talking bad about anybody, but I'm almost wondering, too, is a big problem that they did in school with me is they um, they told me, our classes, when you get out of this class, you guys should be making 150 grand a year. So we're all like, hell yeah. Like, we're going to yeah. come out working at a dealership making 150 grand a year. Back then, too. And back then, I'm like, and then reality hits, and I go apply at Caterpillar for a job when I get out of school, and they go, 18 bucks an hour. And I say, $18 an hour, 150 this isn't going to work. What? Like, wait, what? And they're like, well, that's I mean, our 180 tier. an hour. They're like, that's our <laughs> tier uh, two. We're going to tier one was like 16. Tier two is 18. And then they're like tier three at the time was like 22. And I was like, well, what's beyond that? And they're like, well, it's kind of, you know, that's tier three is like the best. And I'm like, well, you get good benefits and that kind of stuff. But I ended up declining. I ended up, they called me back, and, that, and of course, I was trying to get a job right after the 07 recession or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, housing and market so It was like 09, 10. It was 2009 or 2010. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and they called me back, like, we can get you in at the Tier 1 for a washing position for washing equipment. I said, dude, I didn't just spend, you know, 30 grand, 35 grand on schooling. I got debt. To get, yeah, I, got, I can't. I ain't washing the equipment, but I'm a yeah. mechanic, and I don't want to, you know. So that was, you know— um, I guess, uh, you know, they tell you, yeah, you're going to make 120, 130, but you don't, you have to work up to that. And, and I still, to this day, if you're in a dealership and I could be wrong, I know guys make great money in dealerships, but they're also putting in 60, 80 hours a week. Service writers and make great money. Service writers make a lot of really good money. They make really they, great they money. They make great money. But the mechanic, and if you're in good with your service writer and your service writer likes you, then you can make more money as a mechanic from what I've been told. I've Which never, is a sad reality it is, to think you know, about. Yeah, be nice to your service riders because they, will, they yeah. will help you just like, you know, you help them, they will help you from what I'm told in that industry. And uh, But, yeah, your you, mechanics coming out, I probably, I mean, like I said, I know guys that work at dealerships, and they make good money. Might be a low hundreds, 120, 140, maybe 150. I don't know exactly, but like they said, they work 60, 70 hours a week. They're there. 
10 to 12 hours a day mm -hmm. and they get one day off. Well, the dealership, even like the, the work model is changing where like if you work at like Kia and an engine blows up, you get like a whole new subframe and whole new deal to just really? kind of like put in like they, oh yeah, they're just like, just replace the whole well, thing. But that's how a lot of stuff's gotten too. You know, people have gotten lazy and it's throw like, it away. Like we used to have to figure stuff out. You had to know how to diagnose stuff. And a lot of guys will get out of school and they just want to throw parts at stuff. Or, oh, I work for a dealership. We would just replace it. And I'm like, we don't just replace it. Like if it, yeah. if it's got a, you know, there's some things that we do, but like, we, we don't just replace it. Like, you know, we want to fix it. Why did it fail? Did, was it failed because the part was junk? Because there was abuse? Was it neglect? Was it just worn out? Or do we have another issue there? And so that's like big on how we try to do things. So we fix the problem and don't have a repetitive problem. Yeah, because you're fix could just end up the same broken part again. exactly and then customer's not happy you're not happy and the whole deal just sucks all the way around so yeah i think a lot of people try to avoid dealerships like the plague absolutely as much as they can a lot of dealerships there's some good ones but you know dealerships really i hate i mean there's some good ones out there but there's also some bad ones but you run in that same thing with independent shops there's some good ones yeah. There are some bad ones, and, you know, you just have to figure out which ones you like best or which ones work best. Yeah, I'm talking to Matt Hurley to try to get him on because dealership, For Chevy sure. dealership. I'd yeah. love to hear what he's gone through in the last freaking five years. Oh, of, man, it's... it's His model has changed so much. Like, used cars are now booming in new car dealerships because yep. they can't get new cars. Yeah, you go by dealerships now, and most of their inventory is used cars. Yeah. Used trucks, cars, whatever. It's pretty wild to see. That'd be cool to get him on. And their new car prices... Yeah on used car stuff but yep. because you can't get a new one and that's a lot of people are like i think you know trucks are crazy priced and they are i mean i got guys that are selling trucks right now that are thirty-five thousand brand new back in 06 mm -hmm. and they're selling them for 25 to 30 grand right now and yeah. they're getting it and it's like i don't know how but but i get it because you make the other jump it's either you kind of jump from a 20 to thirty thousand dollar truck to a fifty, sixty thousand dollar truck or a hundred thousand dollar truck, and that's your. So it's like, at what point do you, you know? And a lot of yeah. guys don't want the newer trucks with the emission problems. They want to get something that's no emissions, already been deleted or whatever. They don't want to deal with something brand new with emissions. Same with like RVs. Really, people are just because you want it before emissions. Yeah, like you want to try to find one. Like it's a weird deal. It's like oh eight, whatever ish, like oh nine. Well, I bought mine, and I made sure it had no emissions on it. I didn't want to deal yeah. with it. I got, like, a 2001, and it's uh, and it has no emissions on it, obviously. And yeah. So that worked out good. Such an interesting world to try to avoid. But now we're getting so far into this emissions world that, what, are you going to buy something pre-emissions? You're going to buy something that's 20 years old. 20 years old, you're going to run into problems also. Yep, you're going to run into issues, you know. But even think about beginning of emission compliance oh. stuff is even scarier it's almost so bad the, oh, that like, crossover oh, into man. the emission where they didn't really know what they were doing yet they didn't i mean i oh like and i will say this like the emissions have come a long way like you buy a truck that's i tell anybody all the time and they're like what year would you buy or i said if it's a 17 or newer they pretty much have i don't want to say it's foolproof and it's not going to fail but that's the best newer truck 17 or newer they pretty much have all that stuff figured yeah. out they have the better quality like dpfs back in the day they were using these different metals and i mean they they just you would get like a new dpf it's worth like 150 dollars on scrap the old dpfs were worth 800 dollars six eight hundred dollars all the platinum and stuff they put mm -hmm. in them and so they were still learning on what to use and what to put in them and uh but um they hadn't had it figured out i mean 08 09 10 the worst for emissions. I mean, six fours and the early Duramax and the Cummins, all that stuff. Emissions were just the worst on those trucks. Yeah, it's a scary world because we all, if you need to tow, you got to figure out what you're doing and you do how you're doing it. Because I just watched, I mean, Taylor Ray had a brand new. He did. He had a brand new truck. He was like, yep. I got a new truck. It's not going to be an issue. Yep. And I hate to see it for him, but like. It's just the world we're going into. Yep. And then they're trying, like, you know, part of that was, like, the CP4 pumps they came out with. You have a CP3 pump that's been proven since 2001, and, or, yeah, 2001 was the first year, and that was a proven pump. They don't really go bad. Yeah. Very rarely. It might lose pressure, get weak. They don't go bad. And then now you go to the CP4 in 2011, and it's a pile of crap. Like, they have issue after issue, but you don't know that for another two years or so because issues aren't really 
happening constantly yet. And when that goes bad, it takes out your whole fuel system. And it's like, ah, it is what it is, man. It's on you. It's not on you, really, but it's like, you know, it is what it is. And, like, when when uh, a few years ago, it was like nobody could get the parts sometimes. So you'd have a truck sitting there. There's countless trucks sat at my shop for six-plus months just waiting on one single part for, like, an emission system or an engine and stuff. It's, it's just it's insane. And yeah. It, I feel bad for him. He had a really bad experience. I've been fortunate I haven't had that happen. But, you know, I, I, I do – consider myself fortunate not to have to deal with that but it's a scary it's a scary deal because it's such a needed vehicle and we all kind of kind of need them in the car world we do absolutely 100 percent needed and maybe you can get away with it going to toter homes i don't really know that whole world no they still have them all in there all the newer stuff has it i don't know it's how the, much better it is or worse or it's all the same it's all the same i mean it's it's it is i mean the the newer the vehicle, the better it's come. Just like anything else, the better it's the better it is. But you still have all this stuff that can fail. One sensor can cause a failure yeah. and shut you down on the road like that. It feels like we're often a test mule sometimes. Like 100%. just put the parts out. We'll see what problems like we I get said, run I, into. I stated back whenever you know if they want to do that. And if we're and this is my thing on it. If we're forced to have something on our vehicle, it should have a lifetime warranty. Yeah. If we're forced to have it, if you break a windshield, guess what? We're forced to have a windshield. They come out, they replace it for free with your insurance. You get one, you don't get a ton, but you at least have something there where when you're forced to have something, for the most part, that's reasonable, they will, they should, in my opinion, they should maintain that. Mm -hmm. It should be on them. You should get one free emission system at least if we are forced to have it. Because yeah. sometimes when those things go bad, you're talking, you know, anywhere from three, four grand to 10 grand, you know, or more. That's crazy. And that's, that's a lot of money to just have sitting there. And it's people with like truck payments. They're not people with 10 grand ready to spend on something. Cause the, and now the truck payments are a thousand to 1500 a month with the price of the trucks. Yeah. They're a house payment now, you know, that's well, crazy. a house payment from years ago, but I mean, a still. lot of people's mortgage that's in a lot of States. Yeah. My mortgage is four fifteen hundred dollars a month. Cause that's the so. weird thing. Like, you can go out to the middle of Kansas, have a cheap mortgage, but you can't have a cheap truck payment. <laughs> nope. Nope. That's, yeah. It's that one follows same. you. It's yep. not regional. It's, that's national. You know, you can't just, yeah. It's not a location-based so. cost. Like, yeah, we live in Bradenton. It's a high cost of living, but the truck's going to be the same cost. No Your truck's going to be the same cost. Your goods are going to be the same cost. I mean, everything is going to be the same cost, minus, you know, homes, you know. But yeah. That's fluctuate. So. Well, we'll wrap this up, man. Um, where can they find you at? I think it's... Uh... <laughs> yeah, it's pretty obvious. We got a YouTube channel. We can find us uh, at our shop anytime. We're there Monday through Friday. Um, I'm not saying to just show up there. Don't do that. Yeah, but, give them a call but, if you need yeah. actual <laughs> diesel work done. But our channel, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Anybody's got any questions, whatever, just let us know. So Good freaking I wanna deal, man. really appreciate you for letting me come on. Dude, I've been, thank you. I've been giving... Look, I've been giving people a lot of shit. Because you had Garza on here. I know. You had Chet on here. And I said, you know, Cooper hasn't even called me. I said, I'm not even going to answer his call. But I literally answered right away. I, right. <laughs> I I had to build up my skills. I had to get better at it. I so, get it. You know. no, I just mess with you. No, yeah. it's awesome. I appreciate you having me on. It's been Dude, great. Dude, for sure. So much good information. I think this, I, I hope that this opens a lot of eyes to what's going on. I'll probably try to clip some of the EPA stuff and maybe get that out to more masses because it's, it's an education thing that we're running into. We're going to run into that education wall and the ignorance wall and the yep. hide your head in the sand wall. Yeah, yeah, pretty <laughs> much, yeah. That'll do it. Guys, thank you so much for watching. See you next time.